600 Arondo Street in Wenatchee, but I do go up to Chelan and do a clinic up there once a month at our CBCH site up there. And our pediatric group is actually growing. Um, we're getting two new pediatricians over the next six months. Um, and um, we are going to have a little bigger presence in Chelan as well because our clinic up there has two, three very dynamic providers and that clinic's growing and, and there's a lot of pediatric business up there, so to speak. Um, so, um, but yeah, most of my work is here. I brought Bridget um, Forney. She's a case manager. She's going to explain exactly what her job is at our clinic because she, uh, the nursing role at CVCH is, has been um, evolving and is, sounds like it may be finally really more concrete, but she is the one that works directly with the pediatrics at Columbia Valley Community Health. So I was going to let her talk a little bit about her role and then we'll launch into asthma. So Bridget Forney, um, I know I've spoke with several of you on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been at CBCH since September, um, starting as we, our nursing model is began to change when I was hired and then it continues to evolve. Um, I'm in a care coordinator nurse role at CBCH, which is kind of still being defined, um, but I work with a couple of different providers. I work with the, um, our pediatrics team, um, so taking most nursing calls for our pediatric patients. Um, so if you need to reach anyone, if you need to reach medical staff, oftentimes you would be talking to either me or um, our MAs that work with Dr. Baumeister and then Linda mm -hmm. and then the two pediatricians that we'll be getting um, coming this year. So, ba so basically my role, uh, I'm taking those calls, um, communicating a lot with families about medications, um, coordinating with hospital visits, things that are um, more complicated, I guess, that are more nursing roles um, versus MA roles. And then um, my role is going to be starting to include overseeing some different quality measures. So that's kind of what the future looks like for my role. And we know calling our clinic is can be very frustrating. It's okay. You've done it. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, I have to do it too when I'm at the hospital, and I, and I don't do it. I have workarounds because it's very frustrating. So how do they get through to you when they need to reach you in a more expedient? Look, they're all getting their <laughs> <laughs> talking about all the way over here when we get calls finally it's like oh thank you <laughs> thank you for going through that process to reach me um, I unfortunately don't have business cards or a direct line but if you call the main number which is just the 662 6000 um, my extension is 1290 and if Stop. you see um, you can email me that information I can email it out when I send all the other perfect and I'll send my email address also Great. So I, can, I have you can reach any of us at Columbia Valley email. It's just our, it's like I'm B Baumeister at cbch.org. All small caps, small letters. And I'm just B Forney, F O R N E Y. Yeah. And I, and I have found, I know with nursing stuff, and or it's more acute, and email's not real rapid, but. I have found in dealing with or having to communicate with teachers and other school staff that email is does work better. I mean, it's just you know because you can get to it when you can and you're not trying to play phone tag all the time. And um, and I know with the Wenatchee and East Wenatchee school districts, I can get to their websites and then click on an email address for who I need to talk to. I'm sure it's the same at the other schools. I just have one need here. So yeah, we both do. We I, we do email. Of course, you know, no confidential patient information in it. <laughs> Blah blah blah. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can give some. I mean, it's funny they say that, but we got to work around it too, so we can provide the care that we need to to our our kiddos. So anyway, I'm going to talk some about asthma and and what that means and what that looks like, and then um, I know I'm scheduled for an hour and a half, which is kind of long. We'll probably stand up and stretch in 45 minutes or or less, and then I'm going to come back and talk more about 
specifically outpatient treatment, a little bit about inpatient treatment, and show you some of our fun devices that I think most of you, many are using, but I know um, this has changed over the past few years with how we're managing it, and it's we're really getting good at doing it here in Wenatchee through Central Washington Hospital, and I've worked trying to work with some of the outlying hospitals, but it's a little harder to get some places to change than others. <laughs> you guys probably are familiar with that as well. So anyway, I was asked to talk about asthma, and this is very interactive. When you have questions, just raise your hand. I don't have a fancy PowerPoint. I'm, I don't know how to do PowerPoint. Um, and, you know, I'm sure it's not that complicated, but honestly, who usually helps us with that but our teenagers and young kids in our homes. And I'm an empty nester now, so I don't have <laughs> my one techno geek child is off at college. So, um, so, I, so anyway, I just said, no, I, I just can't do that. Um, but asthma, as you know, chronic common condition for children. It's probably one, it is one of the most common chronic diseases of children. Um, which affects them really, it can affect any time throughout their life, uh, childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood. Um, we see peaks of it at different ages. We, many of you, if you've raised kids and seen little kids, like in the first year or two, with wheezing, diagnosed with asthma, that very commonly has been triggered by a viral infection, RSV, if you've heard of that one. The new one that comes out of children's that they test for that we don't, metanumovirus. Um, it's in the same class as RSV. It's just a different type of RSV. But it's a viral illness in kids, particularly less than a year, especially less than six months. And if they have any kind of other chronic health problem, lots of wheezing, coughing, many of them wind up in the hospital on oxygen, needing albuterol, needing lots of suctioning. Um, they have that, and then they very often, like, 50 to 60 percent of those go on to have recurrent episodes of wheezing. Um, although that is the type of asthma that they typically outgrow and often by the time they get to school they have outgrown that um, and they may never wheeze again. So I usually see that you know six months to five years of age. Their asthma comes on mostly when they get sick with a cold or something. Very well managed outpatient with albuterol. Sometimes we have to step up the therapy depending on the severity, but that's kind of the first group. Um, the second group we see is um, the, the kids that um, have asthma not necessarily related to allergies, that we call them non-atopic kids, I meaning they just have asthma. It's just bad luck, and maybe it runs in their family. Um, and they can start early, but they start to rise. The frequency gets higher as they do hit the school age years. Um, and their asthma has more triggers, and we'll get to triggers in a minute. But they have more triggers, and they stay more consistently affected by their asthma really throughout childhood and quite possibly into adulthood. Um, and then the third set, which actually comes a little later, are the ones that we call the atopic asthmatics. And those are the ones that truly also have many allergies, not necessarily, not food allergies, environmental allergies, um, outdoor stuff, indoor stuff, whatever. And they tend to start, you might see a little bit when they're younger and in the early school age years, but by later grade school, middle school, they're having more trouble. Um, but they often early on have more allergy symptoms that we're dealing with, and then they start to wheeze later. And they're going to have that probably their whole life too. Um, we can help, usually help their allergies with immunotherapy or allergy shots better than we can help their asthma. So it's a chronic condition. We never... We don't ever cure it, we manage it. it. There is that group that outgrows it, but that's not because we cured it, they outgrew it. So we, we can't take credit for that. Um, and, um, and so that group, you know, those younger kids, like I said, many of them will have outgrown it by the time they get to, to you guys in, in the grade school years. Um, but, the, but you see a lot of it in your schools. You know, it varies a lot. Um, it, it is more common in lower socioeconomic classes for reasons we don't completely understand. We think there's many environmental factors that go along with it. Um, but we don't, yeah, we don't completely understand that. But it crosses across all lines, as you know. Um, common triggers or kind of what sets off an asthma episode, allergies are probably the most common thing. 
And now that our springtime is here and all these beautiful flowers are coming up and the trees are blooming, a lot of people are like, oh no, <laughs> because it's going to trigger allergies, which is for some people is going to trigger their asthma. Um, there's a group of diseases called atopic diseases. It's asthma, allergies, and eczema. If you have one or two of those, you've probably got all three of those. <laughs> and it's just, it's just how some people are. Um, and so that's, that's a major trigger. It's animals can be triggers. The whole question of food and asthma, food allergies and asthma, not a strong connection. I mean, food allergies are a separate allergic process, and the, really the severe ones, the mm -hmm. anaphylaxis, sure, you get wheezing when you're in anaphylaxis, but it's, not as, and it's like asthma wheezing, but it's not because of asthma. It's because you're having an allergic reaction. So that's, that's separate. So just having food allergies doesn't necessarily put you at higher risk for asthma or even eczema. Um, colds and viruses, mo probably one of the more common right around allergies as triggering asthma, um, especially for those younger kids that I talked about, but even for the grade school kids and sometimes the older kids, although they seem to be able to manage it better, when they get sick with any kind of cough, cold, any kind of viral illness, it can trigger their asthma. It's, it's why their kids with asthma is one of the high risk groups as far as flu vaccines that we really, really encourage the flu vaccine. Um, this year the flu vaccine's done pretty good. Um, the sickest kids I've seen are the ones that didn't get the vaccine. So it's not perfect, but it, it did pretty good. And you, you know the, um, the successfulness, if you will, of the flu vaccine varies each season. But this year seems they seem to have guessed really good because it's, it is protecting them. But um, that is one of the reasons that kids with asthma are considered high risk and we really push the, um, the flu vaccine on them. Exercise can be a trigger and that we'll talk a little bit more because there's kind of exercise induced asthma which is its own thing. But then kids just with chronic asthma are more at risk um, for wheezing just with exercise too. So it's kind of exercise induced asthma under the umbrella of their already chronic asthma. Um, changes in weather, if it, you know, when it gets really cold, that's hard for some kids. When it gets really hot, that's for, hard for some kids. Obvious irritants, tobacco smoke, we obviously is a major irritant and trigger for asthma. I don't think that's a problem in the schools, right? Directly in the schools. Um, but it, that's coming from some of their homes. Air pollution, but a lot of the stuff going construction and painting and all that's going on in some of our schools that are having a lot of um, remodeling and, and or building being done, that can affect some kids with asthma. So we want those new buildings and that new space. You guys are looking at each other. <laughs> it is, but I know where the, because there's a couple of major schools going undergoing some major renovations. And then strong odors and perfumes can trigger it for some people too. And I know some places of business have set some limits on the, the strong perfumes and that sort of thing, but I don't really see that too much of a problem with the kids. Um, so what happens? So the, the child with asthma is exposed to some, some type of trigger. Um, the other one that didn't show up on my list, I was kind of surprised, is just stress. And by stress, it can be, a, and maybe all the, they're considering all these stress, but we think of physical stress like a virus, um, or cold or weather change, but also emotional stress can do it too, or just life stress. Many of our kids come from homes where there's a lot of stressful things going on. They have a lot of what we consider the adverse childhood experiences in their homes. Um, and that kind of persistent state of hyper alertness, hyper vigilance, hyper stress, that can kind of, that can definitely be a trigger for asthma as well. So it doesn't always have to be some physical thing that sets it off. If there's some emotional or just stressful thing going on, that can lead to problems with their asthma too. So they're exposed to some type, some type of stress or trigger, and the lungs react in a number of ways. Um, they get the actual bronchioles, the ones you have this big trachea and then it branches off and then they get smaller and smaller and that's what's affected in asthma it's not the lung tissue itself it's all these little bronchioles that transport the air in and out that are affected so they get inflamed the actual lining gets swollen it gets red it starts to produce mucus um, which builds up in the airways and then the muscles that sit behind 
kind of the lining, they constrict down in response to this trigger. So there's a number of factors that make those airways more narrow. And when it's narrow, it's harder to get the air in and out. It's just like a straw, and then you keep doing smaller, you know, you, you drink through a coffee stir straw versus a regular straw, and it's kind of that, that effect with the swelling in the airways, the muscles constricting down, and that mucus, and you just, they just can't move air in and out um, like they should. And so our treatments are to reverse all of, try to reverse all of those processes. Um, because it truly to them feels like, like they can't, they really can't get air in like they should. Um, and so how do they look? What does a child look like? I mean, most of you guys um, have seen children that are having asthma attack or asthma exacerbation, but there's coughing, there's wheezing, and I want to separate those two. For kids, for many kids, coughing sometimes is it. Um, you can listen to their lungs and not really, and not hear any wheezing at all. But if they're coughing and coughing and coughing and coughing, and they respond to asthma treatment, there actually is a diagnosis called cough equivalent asthma, cough equivalent wheezing. Um, and, but it's only really in the pediatric population. Wheezing, in our world is something you have to have a stethoscope to listen, to be able to hear. We, parents often come in with little babies and call it wheezing, and what they're hearing is all this congestion and stuff coming from the nose. Real wheezing is what you hear out in the lungs with a stethoscope. Now, it's true, depending on your training and what you've done, if you've worked in hospitals, there are kids that can be so sick with their asthma <laughs> that you can hear the wheezing without a stethoscope. But they shouldn't be in any of your schools, okay? They shouldn't even be in my office. They should be in the emergency department. Because <laughs> um, that's, that's a whole different ball of wax and there's many other symptoms. So it's true, sometimes wheezing is audible. But for most of what we see day to day, you shouldn't really be able to hear the wheezing or the, the person in the office shouldn't be able to hear the wheezing but the child may be coughing, they may look breathless, like they can't catch their breath. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a respiratory score a little bit later that we use, but we often kind of look at the child and see how many words can they talk, can they say before they have to take another breath. The respiratory score for older kids says have them count. If they can count to 10 in one breath, they're not really out of breath. But you know, if it's one, two, three, <gasps> four, five, six, <gasps> you know, that's, that's breathlessness. You can't, ooh, that made me a little lightheaded. Um, <laughs> probably won't keep doing that. Um, so, but the point is, is how much can they talk? Because you can tell by looking at them how many words they can get out. Their respiratory rate can be increased. They might say their chest is tight. They might say their stomach hurts. Kids aren't really good at saying exactly where something is bothering them, right? Every child with abdominal tummy pain, it hurts right here in the middle. Um, but so sometimes it's, they'll say it's their, they might say it's their stomach or they might feel sick to their stomach, like nausea, which can also come if you're having trouble breathing. They feel out of breath. They might just be agitated. Sometimes, you know, you've just seen them kind of with the big eyes and the like, they can't really tell you what's wrong, but something's not right. Um, and so they look like they're agitated. Their heart rate might be up. And then obviously they can't, they can't do sports and run and that kind of thing. Um, but the younger kids sometimes, they just, they, they just look, you know, they can't use their words, but they just the look on their face. And I know you guys have seen it. Um, so besides, you know, you can look at how, how they're talking, how many words they're saying, how many numbers they can count. If they're working harder to breathe, even without a stethoscope, you can see retractions, right? Where you're, you kind of see it suck in when you breathe, a common one, because kids, Kids in your office have clothes and things on. At our office, we make them take those off. Um, but you can just look right here, um, suprasternal notch. If that's going in every time they take a breath, that's a retraction. You can just pull up their shirts a little bit and look at their ribs. If when they breathe in, you can see the outline of their ribs, that's a retraction and that they're working harder to breathe. And then sometimes the way they're holding themselves too. Kids that are having trouble breathing, they don't wanna lay down. They don't want to lay down because it's harder to breathe when you're laying down. And they often will sit kind of, they, they may sit 
but they're going to put their hands on their knees and kind of lean forward like this. And what they're trying to do is get their chest as big as they can make it. So if they can physically get their chest bigger than their lungs, it makes them feel like they can get more air in because their lungs have more room to expand. So this kind of forward position, they get their arms out like this, that's where they're comfortable sometimes. Um, and if they, you have them lie down and they don't want to or they get right back up, let them be in the position that they're most comfortable if they're really having that much trouble breathing. But sometimes that's the way they look, by, just by their position. Um, and then obviously not everybody with asthma has the same symptoms, so every child's a little different there. Um, and we do what we, yes? The cost equivalent asthma that you were talking about, yeah. that it's mostly seen in pediatrics, do you mean zero to 18 or is it seen in the lower ages? Lower average? So, um, so the question is, the cough equivalent asthma, is it mostly just in the younger kids or all the way up to 18? We see it more in the younger kids. I was just trying to think. Um, grade school. Grade school, but I don't really, I can't really think of a teenager, like, 12, 13 or older that I've made that diagnosis in. Yeah, and maybe it's because they can use more words to describe how they're feeling, um, and the younger kids can't, but even, I think I want to say even yesterday or the day before, um, I had a child that just coughed, they just cough and they cough and they cough, and it's, they respond to albuterol, um, but yet their lungs are always clear, and that's hard because if they go to emergency rooms or walk-in clinics or places like that, and the provider's like, but your lungs are clear. You have a cough, and the mom's like, "Yeah, but it's been six months of cough." <laughs> you know, so then they usually get referred to their primary care provider. So young, a little bit younger, grade up through grade school, perhaps. Yeah. The other group of kids that we tend to see in our offices are the kids that are very sedentary, overweight, and they, you know, they'll tell you how they have asthma, and of course, the parents don't want them to be in PE. They want, you know, all of those things. And it's like, boy, what you need is. I'd like to double dose your PE. Right. Um. <laughs> no, and they're looking at that. Um, the last time I heard, you know, like a pediatric pulmonologist talk about asthma, there were kind of three big things they're looking at as to what can we do to help this? What are their, are their new thoughts? And obesity is a, a big one. They're trying to see what the connection is. Is it really there's more asthma or is it really... They just have decreased lung function because they're so big. They're, and, they're, and they're just out of shape. So they're out of shape. Just tell them, well, you know, if I had to go out and run a mile, you know, I'd be breathing mm -hmm. hard too. Right. Whatever. Right. I, you know, whatever you're doing, and, you're not used to doing it. Right. And we, we, we get, I see in the office, and I know over the years, because I've been here a while, I've had people leave my practice and go other places when I say, no, I'm not excusing him from PE. Right. Yeah. If it's because of asthma, we need to manage his asthma better or her asthma better. Asthma should not interfere with any activities the child wants to do. And we have Olympic athletes with asthma, you know. Um, and so that's what I try to tell them. Now, that's not always what they want to hear. Um, <laughs> and so I think maybe they find a different answer somewhere else. But my philosophy is I don't write excuses to stay out of PE for asthma. I don't see many. Don't. Good. I don't see You shouldn't. Because if no. it's asthma is the problem, we can manage the asthma better to keep them in peace. But some of the kids do have inhalers, and then they'll come in, and That's by the hard. time you kind of have the conversation and reassure them, they're not out of breath at all. I know. And you send them back without, I mean, to me, I wouldn't give him the inhaler if it's just because he's out of shape and he's in a PE class. I know. It's a tough call. It is a it's tough, a tough call. call. Because what, we, what I hear, because um, I see those kids too that are overweight and they say that, or they come in because they think they have asthma because Uncle Joe had asthma, so he must have asthma um, because he can't run the length of the block like the other kids can, but he weighs 60 pounds more than they do too. You know, and you t I have that conversation, but they, you know, it's true. I give out inhalers saying, well, try it, and which is pretty much a people you know it's going to help right. in their mind it's going to help and I try we I think mean, and I don't mean just me I speak for all of us that are seeing these kids I think we all try you know but we're kind of pushed sometimes to do it because and then I don't yeah you guys have the tough job because I'm sure they do try to get out of PE by saying they need to go get their inhaler yeah and then uh, we're yeah, going to get to that. Kind of an order. I mean, I think that when I get that order, I think 
this kid probably really has a demonstrated exercise yeah. induced asthma as opposed to a kid that the only time you ever see them is when they're doing something strenuous Mile away. in PE. Mm -hmm. So, and, um, and I'll get to my aero chamber talk in a minute, but I think that's a big part. You know, if they can come in and do puff puff in their mouth, they're not getting that's anything. That's, but that's, that's, we'll get to that. So, um, so yeah, that's tough. And, you know, then you do have kids that really do have like exercise induced asthma. Oh, sure. They're real, you know, they're athletic and they, but they, they're not trying to get out of stuff. They're trying to figure out what they can do to stay in there in, you know, doing their sport and their PE and all that kind of stuff. So you really do have the, and then you have kids just with asthma who do want to be athletic and, and do what they have to with their medications too. So um, I thought it was interesting, this handout I found um, with the allergy, asthma, and immunology, people talk about bronchodilators and steroids and really competitive kids. That It is interesting that all of those are banned by the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. So if you, <laughs> <laughs> bronchodilators and inhaled corticosteroids. So if you have, and only once in my 19 years here have I had to fill out a form for a highly, highly competitive swimmer um, saying that she was on a long-acting um, corticosteroid for her asthma. So they can have a doctor's note saying they really do have asthma and they need this, and then they can still use it. But they are banned by those guys. So, um, and I, I can kind of get the steroid part of it. I don't quite get the bronchodilator part of it, but, but they didn't ask me. Um, so what I was going to say is we, we, the way we look at asthma, in each child, and especially now, as of last October, we went to a new coding system, ICD-10 it's called, so all medical providers use this now. We want to get paid for what we do. Um, and so we're, we can't just say they have asthma. Um, it has to be classified as severity, um, mild, moderate, or severe, and then it has to be classified as um, intermittent or persistent. So you can have mild, intermittent, mild, persistent, moderate, intermittent, moderate, persistent, um, severe, intermittent, severe, um, persistent. And treatment, or what different combination of medications we use depends on which class we put them on, put them in. And we have guidelines as to how we put them in those classes. It depends on well, what does it take to manage their asthma, but you know, how many days a week are they using their albuterol? How many times a night are they waking up to use their albuterol? Do they cough when they run? Do they cough when they sleep? How are they going to the emergency room a lot? So there's a number of factors we look at to classify it. And even those little babies that start wheezing at four months old, they're still called mild intermittent asthma because theirs is mild. It's usually just managed with albuterol um, as needed, and it's intermittent. It shows up when they have a cold. Some of those will kind of bleed over, though, into the persistent, mild persistent, too. Um, so, so that's kind of how we look at it. And even on their medical chart now, they have to have one. If, if the provider's getting paid for seeing them for that, they have to have it kind of broken out like that because it gives you a lot more information as to what kind of asthma and, and what you need to do and that sort of thing. Um, and so, and then the medications that we use, there's the most common one, I think, is what you guys see. Um, are what we call the rescue medications or the quick relief medication, which albuterol is the most common one um, still. Um, I think it always will be. Um, but that's the one that quickly, it's called a bronchodilator because it literally relaxes the muscles in those airways, which is one of the three things that is causing the airways to be narrowed. And it works quickly. Um, and it actually, it, it isn't like, boom, it works, although that's what we'd like to think it does. <laughs> but there is a... There's a quick response, and you're listening. If you listen to them after they take it, you sometimes can hear it. But then you wait about 15 minutes, and there'll be even a more significant sustained response. So it works over like 30 to 60 minutes, although there is a pretty quick response. Um, there's some kids you may see are on levoalbuterol or Zopinex. I don't know if any of you see kids on that. Um, so it's a, it's a type of albuterol. It's much more expensive than regular albuterol, so that's why um, we have to fight for it a little bit from the farm, from the um, insurance company. But the way albuterol is, the chemistry of it, it's like two different isomer, isomers, like mirror images. Um, and the number one side effect of albuterol, as you all know, is um, it increases their heart rate, and it sometimes can make them a little hyper, kind of shaky themselves. 
the, the patient taking it. But the effect on, and for most kids, the effect on their heart, we don't really worry about too much because they have young, healthy hearts and they can handle it. But there are some kids with heart conditions who shouldn't have that level of stimulation. And Zofinex, um, levoalbuterol, is just one of those albuterol isomers and has much less effect on their heart. So you do, there are, uh, you know, a handful of kids out there that probably show up with their Zopinex inhaler rather than their albuterol inhaler, and that's why. It's not that it works better as far as bronchodilating, it just has less effect on their heart. So that's why some kids get it. If they have it, usually they have another diagnosis. Um, so, but you don't see it much just because we, do, we it's very expensive. Um, so albuterol, and we'll go over how we dose that and what we do in a little bit later. Then kids that wind up on anything really beyond mild intermittent asthma typically need some type of long-term control medicine, uh, maintenance medicine. There's different words people use. And the most common one of these are the inhaled corticosteroids, um, Rhinocort, um, Flovent, um, Qvar, um, Budesonide, I can't think of the brand name of that one. Um, anyway, there's, there's a lot of them. And those, though, really should not ever be given in the school setting. Those are given once or twice a day. And that should always be at home, I think. I know sometimes there's medications we think should be given every morning at home that you guys end up giving at school <laughs> because otherwise they don't get given. Um, I see that more with the ADHD medicines. <laughs> um, and so I don't know if I don't ever really fill out medication at school forms for these medications, or if I see it, I'm like, really? They need this at school? Why are we doing this at school? Um, and sometimes it's just education for the parent. But I find that maybe that they don't understand what the difference between the two yeah, is. Yeah, right. And that's, that's, that comes down to us. That's our responsibility and how we're teaching them. Um, and it's, and as, as you know, when we're seeing patients and we're introducing medicines and talking about chronic conditions, the first time we say it, they're not going to get it, you know. And so we do schedule follow-ups and we see how they're doing and we try to keep reinforcing it, you know. And, and it is tough, true, if they go to other places like walk-ins and ERs, they sometimes hear different messages. And so that's confusing for the families too. And then what the insurance companies do to us, I order Flovent because they're all generic. Um, and then they're like, oh, we don't cover that one, we cover QVAR. So then I have to go back and put in QVAR and then the parent's like, so it's confusing. It is. And so that's our responsibility to keep teaching them. What, yeah. I usually don't sign a form for a long-acting medication at school form until we've cleared that up with the mom. I'm like, oh, let's go back to the mom and see why she's asking for this at school. There was a question. Yeah, because that's such a persistent problem with the parents just can't understand the difference between the two, I've always wondered why you couldn't give them a handout a patient teaching handout that in a couple of short sentences, and maybe even put it on that magnet stuff that you can put on the refrigerator, you know, where you can print stuff, that tells the difference. Because yeah. honestly, so often, I have a lot of special ed parents with my yeah. special ed kids, and they don't get it. They just can't get it straight, which is which. No, it's true. It's true. I, I saw a kid back, um, and I thought we were on one plan and they were do, doing it totally different. But it, but it worked. <laughs> he wasn't in the hospital. <laughs> His heart rate was always going 110 times a minute. No. But no, it's true. I mean, there are ways. And we do send home educational things and we type out a patient plan each time. And, you know, families' lives are complicated and stressful. So. Um, so inhaled corticosteroids, that's the most common. Um, most are inhalers. There is still one, um, Pulmacort, um, which is an, in a nebulizer form, but insurance companies won't pay for that after like, I think seven years of age because they feel like the kids can do the inhalers. So that one, if we have babies um, sometimes that need an inhaled corticosteroid and we can't get the inhalers to work for because they're babies, um, that wasn't me, no, um, we can use that too. Um, so there are some long-acting bronchodilators that come in combination with the corticosteroid. Um, Advair is a common one. 
few Meridorols, I can't even say them, which tells you I don't prescribe them much. And we don't prescribe them much. Um, they use them more in adults. There's a lot of them on that have commercials on television. Um, that they're not really, um, I know that Advair is approved for kids, I think down to two or three, but I think that's the only one. The problem with those, they work great. Um, like I said, they're a combination of a long-acting bronchodilator, so like a long-acting form of albuterol, and a corticosteroid. But lots of research has shown that having one of those, if you have asthma and you're using one of those, your rate of dying outside of a hospital actually goes up rather than goes down. And the reason is that people rely on it too much and go to the hospital too late. You know, they think, oh, I've got this, and I'm going to do my puff my albuterol, my albuterol, my albuterol, and maybe they'll do that again. And it's always like you never use that more than twice a day. And um, But people try to treat themselves. And so it's not a huge difference, but it's not like this has been like the nirvana and is, is managing everybody's asthma. So, but again, rarely, rarely used in children. Um, Chromalin and Theophylline, aren't those some old names? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, I was last night, I was like, I should have them raise their hand if they've ever used Theophylline to treat asthma. <laughs> I haven't seen it used in years, uh, not even in a hospital setting. Um, uh, leukotriene modifiers, again, that's something the kids would be on at home. Some parents ask for this. The, the common name is Singular or Montelukast. Um, so it's a it's an anti-inflammatory, but it's not a steroid, which is appealing. Some people really just freak out every time you use that steroid word, and so they don't want the steroid. Or maybe the steroids didn't work. This is kind of the next step up. It's a it's a pill, it's a chewable pill. The kids take it at nighttime. It really works great. It actually has also been approved to treat um, a allergies, allergic rhinitis. Your insurance would never pay for it for that because you got Claritin <laughs> and Zyrtec. But we can sometimes get them to pay for it if we have asthma complicating the allergies. And, and it's easy to take and it works well. Um, questionable whether it's really as effective as the corticosteroids, but it is a good alternative if the, kids, if it just, the corticosteroids don't work. So the way these long-term medications work on asthma is by taking care of those other two things that are causing the, the narrowing of the airways. They, it, they're anti-inflammatory, so they help reduce the inflammation. When you reduce the inflammation, it helps you clear up the secretions. But they take time. They don't work quickly. You know, anytime you have swelling and you take ibuprofen, it doesn't work instantaneously to get rid of the swelling. It takes time. So, and that's how, that's how these work, is by helping reduce it if it's there and prevent it from starting in the first place is the goal. And sometimes with the flow vents and the rhinocorts and stuff, um, we will keep them on like two puffs twice a day as their maintenance. And then I say as soon as they start to cough, runny nose, sneeze, anything, you bump it up to four puffs twice a day. And sometimes we do that and we can keep them off of oral steroids. It's always our goal to keep them off of oral steroids if we can, just because they have a lot more side effects. Um, but so you can, you can play around or change the dose of the inhaled ones in a way that can kind of keep you off of those. So that's, we like that flexibility. Um, so, and then there are some immune modulators they're developing, but again, it won't be for kids. <laughs> is that the immunomodulators, is that the one, um, I've done the camp, camp nursing and I have these kiddos that come in and it's liquid, you keep it in the fridge and it's with allergies and asthma and it's like, like building up their immune system to a certain, the antigens. I, you know, I honestly have never heard of that immune modulator, so I don't know what they're using it for. And, you, and I had several okay. kids that are using it, so I don't know if it's coming from the allergy clinic. Or the pulmonologist, the yeah. And they, they're building up, kind of like if you have, say, it's an, allergies, and you give them little tiny bits of uh, whatever, but this huh. is, I think, pollen and things like that, but it also helps with their asthma, and they... <clears throat> No, this is this would not be like an allergy shot, even in a liquid form. This is a medication that's going to target a specific part of the immune system that's triggering these reactions. And that's so what that medicine is doing. Okay, and it all right. Builds it up so they have less of a reaction to it, hmm. and it helps with. Their I I meant to look it up, but I did oh, I didn't no, last okay. night. So because I just I've never seen it used, um, and I know that most immune modulators are horrifically expensive, and even for the the few indications that we have in other conditions, 
It, they're usually also IV medications or injection medications. And I'll look it up. Yeah, I do too. So it's just, it's certainly, it's not a prescription I know that I would ever write initially if it was started by a different specialist, you know, and, and we were continuing it. But I haven't seen anybody on it yet. So I think it's pretty new. Um, yeah, so asthma control, we talked a lot about, we want to prevent you know, if the, the medication, we indicators that whatever plan we're using, if we are on any daily plan, isn't working, is just increasing symptoms. Every day they have some symptoms. Every day they're coming to use their inhaler. They're waking up at night. Asthma is a nocturnal disease. Anybody with asthma knows it's worse at nighttime. I had a parent ask me that the other day. I'm like, I don't know. Let's find that out. And then we don't have to work anymore. Um, <laughs> but it, it is, it's always worse at nighttime. And so that's kind of a sign as to whether the medicine we're doing is, use, is working or not. Um, and then if you just, the kids are just, you know, they're not able to do their normal activities. They can't, you know, when they run, they can't keep up with their peers and it's not for another problem like obesity <laughs> or something. But they, it does affect them. Um, and they don't always voice it. You know, again, they don't know how to say it. They're just, they're just not as active as they were before or wanting to do as much. Um, Peak flows, Bridget and I were talking about this because you were saying in your training, you know, it's, it's really encouraged monitoring peak flows. It's, it's not controversial, it's just questionable how much it, it, it really helps manage because peak flow meters are very easily manipulated and the kids know it, you know, <laughs> especially as they get older. You know, the young kids can buy into it and they'll always, oh, go hard, go hard, give it me, you know, and they're totally into that. But they, older kids, and by older it may even be later school, school age or grade school age, know that if they just don't blow very hard, then it's going to be low and it's going to look like they're having a bad asthma attack. So are they really helpful? And my training, what I keep hearing is they're really not all that helpful. And plus it's another device um, you got to keep track of and... And that sort of thing. So we don't really, when I started, we were measuring them in the office at times, but it, we don't do them anymore, you know. So, and I, I was kind of curious if any, does anybody use them or is it part of anybody's asthma plans? No. Sometimes from Occasionally. Do they? Yes, but then I rarely actually get a peak flow meter from a parent, so I'm like, well, <laughs> well, and it always comes down to, too, that you're, they're asking the insurance company to pay for that, and will they pay for two? Will they pay for one in the home, and will they, I mean, you know, we can get them to pay for two albuterol inhalers, um, and the aero chambers we just hand out from the office, but they're, you know, they may not be wanting to pay for two of those. And, yeah. There was another question or comment about that? No. So, anyway, it's, I'm sure there's some in the Northwest asthma and allergy people. I can see where they would want to try it, but I don't know what the follow-up is on it. And that um, kind of leads me, I did want to ask about just asthma action plans in general. Do you, do you guys get, I, I gave a copy of this, I didn't do it in color, you know, the green, yellow, red things. Do you guys use these or do you get these? Does, have you ever seen them? There's a number of, oh. oh. It, they rely a lot on um, the peak oh. flow, um, but I just didn't know. I was just curious as to whether other providers were giving them to you or other outside areas were giving them to you. Um, not really. We're just happy to have orders in an inhaler. Yeah. And if we'd really like to get a spacer. Right, exactly. Uh -huh. No, because I, I know they, they push it. I'm sure the Northwest Asthma and Allergy people push it. Um, saying this is the greatest thing, and this is from the allergy, asthma, and immunology people, and yes, you should have this, and I just, you know, it's good in theory, but I don't know how much it really works, you know, on the front lines if they really are reaching for it. So we, I don't really have one. I know Linda Michael, who I work with, I think she does one pretty consistently. I don't know that it shows up at school. I think it shows up at home. And maybe that's what's on their refrigerator. Yeah, this is just one I found, and you know, but they all are kind of based on the green, yellow. The order for the bed. I mean, she doesn't give us anything that remotely resembles. Oh, okay. Okay. So probably it's just a parent. Yeah. So, but they're out there. There's different forms of them, but I, yeah, I haven't found that they've really, really helped in the in the real world. So, and I just wasn't sure what what your um, 
experience with them was, oh, I, so I was talking about obesity and asthma, and they're trying to see if there is any link beyond just the fact that the children are overweight, and if you're overweight, it affects how well your lungs can work because you just can't move your chest as well, or is there something else about being obese that leads to higher rates of asthma? Also looking at um, vitamin D, we're looking at vitamin D for everything. Because <laughs> everybody's low in vitamin D, it seems like. Um, but there seems to be some early evidence that low levels um, doesn't cause asthma, but it makes your asthma more difficult to control. So they suggest if we really are having difficulty managing a child's asthma, um, just to make sure they're getting adequate vitamin D. And again, a lot of insurance companies are saying, don't, don't, don't order the test because they're low. And we don't want to pay for it. And we won't pay for it because they're low, because everybody's low. So just give them vitamin D because <laughs> it's cheap, it's available. Just make sure they're taking it. So, you know, it's not unreasonable. Um, and then there's actually been some studies out, um, the association that maybe Tylenol, acetaminophen, can trigger asthma. Oh, wouldn't that be unfortunate since that's what the kids get for their fevers when they have a cold that causes them to wheeze. Um, but it's not strong and they're doing more research. But it was interesting that, um, that it kind of came out and they're, they're actually looking at it a little bit closer. Um, yeah. Do, do, do. I think that's a lot of what I wanted to talk about, just about asthma in general. Do you have any questions? Yes. I've got a student that when he, he's, I would call him moderate in asthma because he was overweight and, you know, mm -hmm. he has lost weight. He's gotten better at managing, you know, PE, interesting, as he's lost weight. And, but he always came for that excuse all the time. And he's babied for his age. He's very, you know, much coddled at home and stuff. And it's an excuse for him. So we get right. absence, absenteeism, all that stuff. Anyway, so we've worked through all that as he's maturing. But he always says his... He's in pain. He'll actually hold his lower, like, rib, lower lobes at the bottom of his ribs. And he, I've never seen a kid do that, but that's what he'll do. Hmm. I mean, do you have people that have that type of symptom? Not generally, and I wonder if there's some association oh, no, with his size. Yeah. What were you saying, Bobby? A <laughs> stitch. I said it's called a stitch. He's yeah. out of shape. That I know it well. well, it could be. I mean, I mean. <laughs> When I've seen kids having serious, serious asthma uh -huh. um, episodes, like where you are in the ER, the hospital, the ICU, they're not complaining of chest pain. Um, yeah. um, they're complaining of nausea from all the albuterol we're giving them. But, um, but they're not saying that their chest really hurts. So I wonder if that could be more due to his size, his obesity, well, and he's just not, he's, he's not, not that big anymore. Not anymore. That's, what's been That's impressive that he That's lost weight. That's still a persistent bizarre when he's really struggling that's what he'll do and he's in that position hmm. and then he'll say oh my that's his what he that's does. His, that's what he does yeah and then all of a sudden he's decreased you know he has diminished breast on uh -huh. basis when he sounds when he wow. complains about it and then does it go away him. after does it go away after you give him some albuterol and he yeah, it does his does pain decrease. goes away mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I don't know if it totally resolves. Yeah. It's hard to tell with them. I mean, he always yeah. says he feels better and stuff, but he's doing the first breathing. He's leaning over, it, but he's so dramatic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre. Yeah. And they even learn to do that stuff. Well, that's why <laughs> it looks like that to me. Like, wow, that's interesting. Kind of thing How old is he? He's um, no, he's a sophomore, but oh, okay. he functions more like, you know, a yeah. couple years younger. Yeah. He always has, so... But I I mean they can complain of chest and abdominal pain. I haven't seen it often, but you know I guess if he gets relief with his bronchodilator, then for him that's the way it feels. You know. Yeah, I just wondered. Huh. Yes. Uh, I had a couple of questions. One, um, I work in the junior high and the senior high, so it's eighth grade through twelfth grade, and we every year, as part of the school requirements, we send out to parents a uh, health information form that asks them to list what kind of health problems their kids have. So by the time these kids get up in the senior high level, we have such a huge number of kids who are labeled as having asthma. asthma that we have to decide what to do with. There was a time that I would mail home assessment, asthma assessment <laughs> forms to mm -hmm. determine what their level of asthma is and I would get maybe two out of 50 back. So it, it wasn't a very valuable tool. Right. Um, there are a couple issues that I have. One, 
It's very frustrating, I think, from our standpoint, and I can see it for families also. Like you said, you know, kids having a short of breath or whatever, finally you give them an inhaler, mm -hmm. and then the parents assume that they have asthma, mm -hmm. and it kind of sticks with them for a long time. And I think that's that's very undesirable. But what I'm also seeing is a huge number of these kids that have anxiety disorder and panic attacks. And so I'm getting a lot of them coming in, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. They're hyperventilating. They're assuming that they need to use their inhaler. And sometimes, because they, then they're carrying them and they will have used their puffer, you know, five or six times and they're just yeah. so- Now they're really <laughs> tachycardic and anxious from yeah, all the unbutyrol. I can't <laughs> Exactly, and okay, so then on top of all this, I just read the paper a, year, a week or so ago about some um, European study that indicated they felt that almost half of all people diagnosed with asthma was uh, a false diagnosis. So I just wanted to get your perspective on this whole right. thing. Are we dealing with a huge population of people who think they have asthma and they don't and we're missing? treating them and how careful you have to be well i do i do believe that it's over diagnosed and i think it also what i think happens is they get that diagnosis early and the parent just keeps keeps uh, saying yeah. from maybe they really were sick with rsv in the hospital when they were six months old and then they had wheezing off and on until they were three years old you know in our world though they're over it if they haven't wheezed for two years or three years i'm like it's done i you know i've told parents i'm like i'm taking this off their problem list they don't have asthma anymore mm -hmm. you know would you tell them to notify the school yeah no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but i was gonna say that doesn't mean in their mind they take it off and many parents continue to see their kids as vulnerable and needing special coddling for this or that, or if they don't make the varsity tennis team, it's because of their asthma, you know, or something. So I think the word, once it's said, it does get carried on. And it sometimes makes me feel bad, because there are some kids that really do have bad asthma. Yeah. And some people, and then you look at them like, yeah, really, you're wheezing? And it's like, no, really, and I they know, are. Or um, do you see, you know, a lot of the, the asthma, and I appreciate it, because it's a lot less, <laughs> but there are a lot of them that the kids they have the inhalers that are there, but they've never used them once in school, mm -hmm. you know, and then I even look back at the year before it wasn't used, but we have to keep on having them get new ones, and I was talking to Bridget about that, and I actually appreciate that, right. that they're being DC, right. you know, right. and, that, and it's mm -hmm. been a great, like, half of them, like, yeah. in the last year is, so that has been so oh, good. good, like, it was a, a, a good thing, and Bridget and I were talking about that just a lot of them, the kids mm -hmm. don't use them, and it doesn't right. seem like they have that problem. But they, I think a lot of it is parents, like they already been, they've been labeled. Well, they had it. Right. They just want it there just in case. Just in case. But right. well, that makes us have to send them on field trips yep. and everything else. And I love this one. Like I had this one just today. I have a kid that's on oxygen intermittently, depending on her O2 stat. She's got a chronic lung disease. Oh. Fifty percent of her lung. Oh, you know, she's got real disease, right? Go mm -hmm. PD. Yeah. Right. But even her today, bless her heart, fantastic parents, I'm not trying to be critical, but today I want to get the field trip sign up where it says, does your child need medication on the field trip? The parent mark, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like, well, if your oxygen compressor, your inhaler, your portable <laughs> that's just monitor, like a, That's just like a toothbrush and a hairbrush. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then no, no, I mean, and then the other thing you get is like you'll have people that have this right. err on the side of caution because if it says they have asthma, we can't decide that they don't and, right. and they don't need them. So I have somebody who had his really a big wig in town, and his son is on full vent every day, right? And for yeah, yeah but supposed he to be. doesn't have asthma. Oh, he just takes full vent, <laughs> and he's got a nighttime bed, right? And he's on a field trip today because he doesn't need any medication with him. You know what I mean? Oh, he, okay. Yeah, yeah, and he and he's 18 now, and he has the same attitude about it too. I thought, what the heck is That's that? That's interesting because we can't even send prescriptions in. Every prescription we send in now has to have a diagnosis with it. Why well, are you wondering. prescribing this vitamin D for this baby? Because it's a well baby who's breastfeeding. Why are you prescribing oh, this Flovent? Because they have mild intuition. So do we get asthma. that diagnosis now? Because like what, well, the parents the time, can see it. <laughs> well, we don't get it when we send no. in for doctor orders. If it is said no. mild, moderate, and severe, they don't even check it. It's just like just check the box. I mean, just so we have some clue. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's so mm -hmm. frustrating. Right. You know? No, they they should. I mean, we literally have to have to put in some 
level severity of asthma now. Huh. Well, um, maybe we'll see more. Maybe that. yeah, that started in October. So after the start of the school year, so um, so maybe it'll get more specific now um, because we have all those codes for mild, moderate, severe, intermittent, persistent, but then we can add on exacerbation of mild, persistent asthma because that then that allow doesn't allow us, but it explains more of what we're prescribing. It's all a really good system because you have to justify why are you giving this kid flow vent? You have to document it. You have to justify why you're doing that. Sure. So at least, you know, in the past we could just say, oh, asthma or cough and give it, and you really can't do that anymore, or you're not supposed to. Huh. But I did want to get back to your question about the anxiety, because I think anxiety and depression, whole another talk, but is, under, is underdiagnosed, and um, especially in the older ages, like middle school and high school. And they do come in with these symptoms, you know, and it's easy to it's easier to say, oh, it sounds like it might be asthma. Let's try this. Versus, wow, what else are you feeling? What else is going on? Why don't you answer? Do this little screen for me. What's that a screen for? I'm not anxious. I'm not crazy. You know, it's like, well, just answer some questions for me. Although some of them really are looking for help and are willing to do it. But I think probably the anxiety thing is underdiagnosed and the asthma is overdiagnosed. Well, that's my impression. I, I'm seeing so many more kids coming in with anxiety disorder than I ever see with kids at, with actual asthma problems. I, I mean, maybe, say, two kids out of a month I'll see with actual asthma issue. I mean, having an actual asthma problem and right. maybe 50 in a month with some kind of anxiety-related <laughs> issue. And Which probably isn't being addressed in right. any way but your office. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. In a 15-minute visit. It's very, it's very I mean, challenging. It's a really, uh, I think, it's an epidemic that has... No, it's true, and I, it all comes kind of back to the to the, the adverse childhood experience that I've talked about before and what, you know, the kids are dealing with. And it is, it's hard um, anxiety. It's, you know, the diagnosis is not so hard, but the treatment is. You know, asthma, it's like, oh, here's your inhalers. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> anxiety, you know, there are medications. But it's really some kind of counseling or therapy, and we're especially you guys outside when you have to use financial. I know it's tough. C counseling services, mental health services. Well, yeah. What we're seeing in is now in Okanagan, they're providing school. They're providing mental health counselors in the schools. Oh, okay. But what I'm seeing is those kids with high ACEs. Addressing trauma in the middle of your school day is yeah. really disruptive. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. guess what? They don't want. Oh, it's probably not a very good. Sorry, all that happened. Go eat lunch. <laughs> 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 You know, we thought it, oh, what a great idea, mm -hmm. but now it's uh, like not so great. Not so great. And some of our agencies, I know Catholic Family and Children's Home go to schools yeah, too. I can't say it's necessarily for the severe ACEs kind of stuff, but more for, yeah. And I think it does help because transportation is an issue for many kids. And just, yeah, getting them to their appointments and stuff. So that's a good point. <laughs> um, oh, yes. I had a question. I had a, um, two in the same year, and they started when Laura was still in Okanagan, that were um, misdiagnosed for years with vocal cord dysfunction, like diagnosed with asthma. And we would be like, I, her lungs sound great. And parents wouldn't listen. I mean, how often do you, where do we go? From the, how, well, well, she was middle, middle school. school. She was middle school. school. They're the ones that can do it. The younger kids can't really do it so yeah. much. So what they can do is they can make, they can teach themselves to close their vocal cords so it sounds like wheezing. Um, although down here, like you experience in their lungs, they're fine, but they, they can do it. It's, wow. it's well known. I've heard Dr. Redding, he's like a guru in pediatric pulmonology from children's. He talks about vocal cord um, adduction. It's called voluntary. Wow. He can, he, and usually I've seen it a few times too. I get him, I have him, I'm going to have you go see Dr. Redding. You have such <laughs> severe asthma. I can't manage this. <laughs> I need Dr. Redding's help. And they go, he used to come out here. I'm not sure he comes anymore. And he can differentiate the two. He's got some tricks because he's, you know, he's been doing this a long time. And he can just, and he, when he explains it to him, like, you don't have asthma, you're doing this on purpose. <laughs> and when the parent hears it from somebody like Dr. Redding, they're not going to believe me. Um, and I need Dr. Redding to do it anyway, or someone in his field. 
Um, but that's usually what we wind up thinking. That's tricky because they can totally trick their parents and the parents totally believe it. Right? I almost thought that it was involuntary, right. almost like anxiety. Well, they can do it and anxiousness can do it, but kids can do it on purpose too to get out of whatever it is they want to. This went for years. I mean, I left Okanagan because of this girl. <laughs> She's in college now. She's four years into college, and she came and said, "Oh my gosh, I have vocal cord dysfunction." And I was like, "Who <laughs> 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 knew?" Yeah. But no, it's it's tough, and it usually to me it's a sign that there's bigger problems in the family because the child's doing this to get attention, trying to get attention for something. So what what is missing? And so you know that's a whole Pandora's box. But that's that's tough. It's not real common, but it's tough. Yeah. Okay. So then, with that, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, is there a life-threatening risk at all with that? Uh -oh. So if the kid has truly been diagnosed with that, and they come in the office with an episode, it's really working with them, but it's not going to turn. Eventually, their body's going to say, "I need to breathe." Right? And it's just going to happen. Okay. It's just like, it's the same with little kids and their breath holding spells. Do you may have toddlers oh, that do yeah. that? And what's, what does the body do? They pass out. Because I had a, you know, I'm like, that's saving their life. Their body's like, fine, you're not going to breathe. We're going out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we all, our breathing center is back here and our brain's down. And it's just like how you do have people in comas that, you know, nothing's really functioning, but they're breathing. That's because you can live just on this brain stem because it keeps your heart going, it keeps you breathing. So when a toddler does that, and they hold their breath, and then they pass out, they're passing out because the brain stem's like, fine, all right, you're going out. And then they take in and they start breathing again. So at worst, that's what they would do. But it would be brief, and it would get them breathing again. So the toddlers that do that type of breathing, by the way, too, because yeah. I have this family that's really high needs, and they have um, a, a little boy that has, I mean, when I watch him, he's rattling, and, you know, I can auscultate, you know, wheezes, and, uh -huh. yeah, he's just terrible environmental exposure to smoke and a wood stove, and, you know, it's awful, but, you know, he does that, um, but only with his mom. And isn't that a stress-related thing? It's I'm an very... attention-seeking behavior, too. I mean, yeah. they do it when they're tantruming often because they're yeah. not getting their way. If he won't get picked up by her, he sure. does that. But it, it's interesting because he is getting to the point where he did it when I walked in for her, mm -hmm. and he was getting blue, and it's scary as heck to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're bright red, and then you see this color oh. going, and I'm like, crap. <laughs> 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 go down. I mean, it's... Yeah, I ran over just that nursing thing, and I was like, what? And I picked him up just, you know, and then he, he did that <gasps> for me and settled down. Hi. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you for giving me attention. I was seeking well, the Well, you know, I walk in and the kid's on the floor, he's turning blue, and just sit there, right? I mean, I was like, God. <laughs> I think that would be, it would be hard for any of us not to react to that. So stand up and stretch for a few minutes, because I know we've been, it's always good to get our minds going. Then we're going to come back and talk about the treatment stuff for a few more minutes. So Vicki from, from Grand Canyon University is outside in the lobby here. She's the one who's going to provide us lunch today. So if you want to talk with her, I am attending Grand Canyon University and I enjoy it well, most of the time. Um, when I'm not doing homework. But it's a great program and it's um, it makes it uh, really easy to work with. And um, so, anyway, she's out there and she's. And she has cool things like pins and stuff. What can we do? What are the options? No, I've not. Yeah, no, I've not heard anything like that. <laughs> um, but what I've 
I think they really try to increase our collaboration with the school nurses. And I think now it says Rachel that has all the school nurses together and then a great fight. I just had a kiddo in the beginning. And they're up now. What's going to go to? What days of the week? Their phone number and their fax. Wow. I did last year. What I did is I gave it to them. that they know that they need a Um, 
recycling bin when you're done because it really is nothing that you're going to use in the schools but I thought if you knew what we did in the office what we're doing in the emergency department and what we're doing in the hospital you'll understand where all this came from and this came Wait, which one are you talking about um, it says criteria and respiratory score at the top and asthma um, 3.0 management um, when I first started at CBCH it was about four years ago I brought this with me saying we're changing it up we're getting rid of nebulizer machines and this wasn't just my idea thinking, yeah, let's try this. This came from a talk I heard. At the time, this gentleman um, was in charge of respiratory therapy over at Seattle Children's. Tons and tons of research, I won't go into the details, about why using these type of devices and an inhaler is actually better medication delivery to the airways than the nebulizers. Um, and um, at Children's, 95% of the albuterol that children receive there for whatever it is, asthma, chronic lung, whatever, is administered with an MDI in one of these and not a nebulizer machine. And, um, and that's at Seattle Children's. And a small group of us went over, some respiratory therapists from our hospital, Linda and I went and watched them do it. And it's just a rare, rare child. I True confessions, I did give out a nebulizer machine <laughs> last week because the young guy has autism and cannot do this no way because you can hardly touch him much less put that on his face now why do you get asthma and autism i don't know but anyway so he, we're doing a nebulizer mom kind of chases him around with it it's the best we can do he also gets the montelukast, cast which is the pill because again we can't do the flow vents and stuff because that really requires these but anyway we're really we changed over we started um I headed a work group at the hospital with pediatric nurses and respiratory therapists and said we're going to totally change this up from the moment the child walks in the door. And that's what, um, that's what these two things are. This is a respiratory score. Every child that comes through the emergency room door at Central Washington Hospital gets a respiratory score. You can kind of see, so it starts at the young ages, it works up to four, how are you, and it's assessed on their respiratory rate their retractions, dyspnea, are they working hard to breathe, and what do they sound like? So based on that, they get a respiratory score. That's the first thing. In the emergency room, it happens in the triage. The nurse is doing that in the triage. Then you, that puts them somewhere on this plan. Now this is the one off of Children's website. We, but it's almost the same that we use at, Chil at Central. We had to change it up some because we don't do everything Children's does. Um, <laughs> And we're a community hospital, not a children's hospital, but it's very, very similar. So depending on where they land out with their score, at the top it says respiratory score 1 to 5 or respiratory score 6 to 12. Um, it's, like, it's like golf. You're healthier if your score is low. You don't want a high score. Um, but you see if they walk in with a respiratory score of 1 to 5, the first thing they're going to get is 8 puffs of albuterol. 8 puffs of albuterol with a valve holding chamber, which is what these are. And they're going to get a dose of dexamethasone, which is a steroid. They're going to get it orally. Um, if they're higher, 6 to 12, you're in more trouble. Yes? Well, I was just noticing, I don't see anywhere on here that they have um, um, oxygen uh, active monitor. So saturation just, is not yeah. part of a respiratory That's score. So. No. A, res a saturation is not part of a respiratory score. Thank you. It, I, I had to say that so many times when I was teaching people how to do this. Because you can find, find out a uh, saturation. I, I don't care what it is, really. I want to know what their score is, and we're going to start treating them. Get me one after we've started treatment and tell me how it is. Okay? It doesn't matter. It's not. You're right. I should have pointed it out. But pulse ox is not part of the respiratory score. Well, do you feel that it's important for us to have them? No. <laughs> oh. Not really. Okay. <laughs> Not really. I really don't. I don't. I. I. What my experience 
Because I think, you know, sometimes they're helpful, don't get me wrong, but I think we tend to rely on the number and we're not looking at the kid. And it, I, I get it at, at when I get calls from the ER and the hospital when I'm on call, I'm like, okay, that's nice. What do they look like? You know, does that even go along? Do they look like they have a saturation of that? You know, I'm like, well, I'm like, what's their respiratory rate? Are they retracting? Blah, 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 blah. You know, and sure, on the monitors at the hospital, sometimes it's just they're not picking up and the nurses recognize that. But with the less experience, I can literally just get calls saying, oh, the saturation's 89%. Okay, so what do, what do, what do the lungs sound like? What do they look like? How are they, you know, and they're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. So, <laughs> there, so I, it's just, it's another number. I don't know that it really helps. But do you all have them in the schools nowadays? I think they're nice to have for the opposite reason. For the okay. kid who says that, you know, you, your assessment is he looks fine. Right. And so then I go. Do, I can do an oximetry, and it's 99 percent, and he's uh, absolutely no distress. I can document that and true. send him back to class. True. That's because true. Because we're not running a clinic. Yeah. No, that's true. So for I think in the schools they Maybe provide, it does help. give you yeah. a, they give you an objective number mm -hmm. that validates your subjective assessment. And are your pull socks maintained <laughs> by a bio by a? Absolutely. Really? <laughs> because that is a problem with those. They lose their quality and how well they pick up and how well they function. Ours in the clinics were required, as is the hospital. They have to document that um, bioengineering comes through, I don't know how often, and checks everything. You know, they come through every day and checks the respiratory, the oxygen tanks. You don't want to reach for that tank and have it empty. They check the equipment. They all have little stickers on them, and ours in clinic do too, and I don't know how often. I just know they're checked. They're maintained. So, and I know it's more than once a year. <laughs> well, so, are the cheap ones even very reliable yeah. at all? <laughs> I, I, I can't really comment. I'd have to see what they are, and they, they all require some level of maintenance. Um, so anyway, so you will higher respiratory score. They are started on nebulizer, um, but that's because they're having more trouble. So they if you get a continuous albuterol nebulizer, as you can see, and some ipatropium, and anyway, you can follow the little arrows and see where it goes. But very often, they as the so they do like they give them that eight puffs, they give them their dexamethasone, and that's it. Then they sit there for an hour <laughs> because then we're going to come back and we're going to do another respiratory score. And then the next respiratory score tells you where you go next. And eventually you, you can wind up getting admitted and that sort of thing. But you also get discharged. And I remember when we started this, I was down in the ER for something else, and the doc's like, oh, we got an asthmatic, I'm doing your plan. And um, <laughs> I can't say they all embraced it. Um, but now they're using it. And I've already done APOS. I'm pretty sure they're going to have to be admitted. I'm like, well, okay, let's, um, let's work through the plan. Let's work through the system. I'm here doing this with this patient. Check back, they're like, okay, his respiratory score went down, he went home. <laughs> okay. um, but we have followed, um, we have followed readmissions, kids that bounce back, we call it, that come back to the ER, wind up getting admitted. Is that higher since we've been using this or using these? No, it's not higher. It's not higher, it's actually lower. And um, some of it's because we get them this steroid dose in the ER, because sometimes we give medications in the clinic and the kid never gets it. Um, but this follows them if they're in, in admitted too. And what's nice for us as the on-call doctor is the nurses can move them through these different stages. Once they hit this respiratory score, they move to this level and the frequency of treatment changes. And then, you know, you come in, they're like, okay, they're in phase five, send your kid home, okay. Um, so anyway, it's just, it flows very well. And once they're inpatient, they're, we're using just these and inhalers. We're not really doing nebulization unless they get sick. They go backwards instead of moving forward. So I just wanted to, to kind of show you guys what happens and, or why we're doing this. And then if they're doing it in the hospital, we've got to do it in the outpatient world too, because that's what, that's what convinces parents. And it really has not been hard to convince parents of this. They like these because they're easier to lug around than a nebulizer machine. They're faster, and basically they recognize it works better. So this is the, probably the most common one you'll see. They're different sizes. This is kind of your medium size. We have these cute little baby ones. Aren't those cute? I don't hand those out too often because the kids outgrow them pretty fast. But we do, and the real little ones, we use these. Um, we got 
bigger size. This is adult size, but many kids use that. Some kids like the ones without the mask, but just with the mouthpiece. Um, and um, that works too it, um, if, they, if they're really able to, to hold their mouth around it. Um, I've always been taught that a child 12 or younger cannot use a meter dose inhaler without some type of um, spacer device. Cannot use it effectively. But I see kids all the time, 9, 10, 11. Oh, I just do it in my mouth. Well, I think mm -hmm. I heard that now they recommend it for adults. Everyone they, should be using it. Yeah. This yeah, is, yeah. They hand these out for adults because there's many adults that can't do it. Well, even if they can do it, they say it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's better medication delivery. Kids don't like to carry these around, though, especially in the high school. You know, they can tuck that in their pocket. You can't really hide this as well. Um, but the first thing I do when they say, this, my medicine's not working, you know, it's like, well, how are you administering it? And are you using a spacer device? And the, often it's like, mom's like, oh, yeah, we had one of those once, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> That's just school. Yeah. Don't yeah. <laughs> pick it up. <laughs> well, and the other thing is pharmacies don't carry, it's a rare pharmacy that carries the ones with the mask. They carry these ones, and there's different brands, although I'm usually not a brand pusher, but these Aero Chamber brand, that's the one that's the true valve holding chamber. These work better than the other brands, especially with the masks. Um, so they, they'll carry the adult ones, but they won't carry the ones with the mask. And I'll write a prescription, and they'll give it to the pharmacy, and they get home, and they've got a nine-month-old, and I showed them this, and I showed them how to do it, and then they get home, and they got this. And they're like... Like, so we just um, we just keep these in the clinic, and we bill them out from our clinic. And so we will, if we're in school, I'll give them two, and I'll charge their insurance too. And I think we do get some reimbursement for it, um, but we carry all the sizes, and we just hand them out from there. Um, because we know, then we know for sure they're getting what we want and what we've showed them on. So when we have a child come in with wheezing or cough or the MA puts them in the room and is concerned about wheezing. The first question they're going to go get is one of our nurses. Um, oh, I mean, if we're standing in the hall, they're going to get us, but we don't get to stand in the hall very much. Um, um, when we have a break, we go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I have people say, I'm sorry I didn't show up. I'm like, oh, that's a bathroom break in my schedule, so that's okay. Um, so the, our nurses will come in. Um, it's, it, Bridget's usually on the phone because that's her job, but we do have floor nurses. And they sometimes, very often, will do like a brief respiratory score. Or sometimes I can do it. Linda does it too. And then we, we give puffs in the office. We keep albuterol inhalers, and that's what the emergency room does too. Um, your own little albuterol inhaler. There you can, there you can get the, the albuterol brand. It's like a three dollars and ninety nine cents for two hundred puffs. Wow. Because mm -hmm. that's what came from. Um, in, was one of the things at the hospital. So you can't. You know, it's not like you can take. They're not going to let you take this from patient to patient to patient, or even an inhaler, patient to patient. Even though the inhaler's going in here, not here. So they both pharmacies at the hospital and at our clinic um, were found this this little albuterol thing. It's got 200 puffs, and um, it's like 3 bucks and 99 cents. So we can bill it out as that. So we can hand it out. We can administer it in the clinic, and then we have them go home with this and their inhaler. Um, and I usually do a prescription for an inhaler, too, because they'll run out or they'll lose it or something like that. Um, so, and, that, and then in the hospital, whatever goes in the patient room stays in the patient room and either goes home with the patient or it's thrown away when the patient's done. Nothing comes back out. So I'm always like, drop that in your bag, drop that in your bag, drop that in your bag. Um, because they really, to take them home, they're supposed to be uh, have a instructions on it and stuff, which we do from the clinic. We just have a little sticky we put on it. So, um, and then these guys, you teach them how to do this. How do you, I'd like you to tell them what you teach, how you teach the parents to, to do these so that we're all doing them the same, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, I don't do it often, but... So um, we have, and depending on the size or the age of the kid is very different, um, but I usually use the teach back method. So normally when, I, when we're administering it in the clinic, I would say generally it's usually four puffs that we're giving. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll usually pull out our sample. So like Dr. Baumeister said, we'll bring in the sample of the albuterol 
it has the instructions on it, kind of um, take them out. I talk to the kid depending on how old they are, just talking to them about why it's important and what it is because they're usually really apprehensive to put this weird thing on their face and free them. <laughs> so um, usually kind of break that down a little bit first and then um, I'll usually, so they put it against you know, nose and mouth, have a good suction or a good um, seal and then they breathe in about six breaths. So it's five to six breaths per puff. So sometimes, depending on the age, I'll have the kid count out, like, you know, in his head, so he's involved and active, um, he or she. And I'll usually administer the first puff, and then depending on the age, either have them administer the next puff or have them on, um, or get my member administer the last three so that they have a good solid knowledge of what they're doing and if they have any questions or if there is anything with administration that I notice that they need some further instruction on them. <coughs> and then I usually teach them how to clean it too. So we have little um, tear, off tear off little mm -hmm. handouts that we can give to the family on how to clean the barrel chamber. And we, um, and um, so the inhaler, you know, if you all know what an inhaler looks like. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask really quick. I have a student who has a spacer and it whistles a little bit when she's using it. Is, is that working effectively? Is it one of the accordion ones? Like it no, collapses? the yellow. Ring. No, then they're breathing too fast. They shouldn't hear a whistle. There used to be one called an inspiris. Do you remember the inspiris? This yes. looked like an accordion, <laughs> a little plastic bag in between. Yeah, and those, you wanted to make those whistles because that means you were breathing in fast enough. Oh. <laughs> You're over there shaking your head. <laughs> but now we, those, are, those were a spacer device, but not the valve holding chamber. The difference is this is a closed container. If you've got your inhaler there, this is closed, so it's a holding chamber. So you puff, and you don't even have to have this on their face to activate it. Because when it's been, we saw that when we were over at Children's watching them do this, that the RT is sometimes down here because the kid might be a little apprehensive and you hear her go puff, and then she brings it up and puts it on their face because they don't open the valve until they take their breaths in. And when they take their breaths in, this little flap, it's yellow here, it's blue, um, it goes back and forth. And so they can see that and they can watch it. So that's one way they can count if they want to. So, and that's why it doesn't, no medicine gets in until they take their breath. So that's why it's called a holding chamber. It holds the medicine even though you can't see anything. And it's puff, breathe five to six times, puff, breathe five to six times. And you always, 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 of course, shake, 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 shake. We teach them that too. Um, and the dosing, because I know this, when we started doing this, I get these calls going, four pops, you want them to have four pops? <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. You remember in the nebulizer machines, we were putting in 2.5 milligrams with some saline, that's what the little fish or whatever were, and four puffs is 2.5 milligrams. So for years we were saying, this guy can't work because we were underdosing them. We weren't giving them enough medicine. And that's what the studies done at Children's and everywhere else did. So four puffs. Now when I send them with a prescription, I'm like, you can do two, my standard is two to four puffs every four to six hours. Sometimes you only need two puffs. But four puffs is not too many and it's not overdosing. Now they're gonna get a lot more in this than they do through the nebulizer, but that's why it works so much better. Do you wait a minute between puffs? Like you don't have to. You don't have to. You, if they're for it, just puff and let them breathe, or you can take it off and let them breathe and then put it back on. Now, but you do not have, have to wait. Spacer, is that the same thing? If they don't have a spacer, should they still be waiting, or does it matter? Uh, I don't know. They don't have to wait. But they, they're, if, if they're only, if they're not using a spacer, they better be really good at it and older. And that's what I usually explain to the family because that gets brought up a lot. Like, oh, like maybe the kid is like, well, I don't want to carry around this thing. I just want my inhaler. Um, so just giving that education on why it's important and how much more effective it is to, for the medication to get into their lungs than they use the spacer. There's a lot of education about that. So mm -hmm. we've also heard in the past that you can put all the puffs in at once and then just breathe over two minutes, but that's not a good idea. Okay, so we need to separate. Yes, you need to separate them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never, I've heard them ask that question, but they're always like, no, that doesn't work. 
I don't know if it's too much medicine, you don't get enough in, I don't know what it is, but you got to do it one puff at a time. And when they do, oh, I'm sorry, the question was, they have heard that you could do all four puffs and then just let them breathe for two minutes. And the question, answer is no, you can't do that. For whatever reason, the research has shown it's puff, breathe five or six times, puff, breathe five or six times. How, how often should they be cleaning the space area? Well, yeah, I mean, at home, the tear-off sheets, we have tear-off sheets from the Aero Chamber people in Spanish and English, and um, I don't even think, I think it says weekly or something. It actually doesn't say how oh, okay. often. <laughs> I usually tell people when it's visibly soiled. Or when yeah, it looks I think cloudy. that's good, too. I mean, it's a sterile medicine. I mean, they can wipe this off, you know. It's only their kid and their puffer, so there aren't really hard and fast. And they're really easy to clean. You just take off this back piece, and then this just soaks in soapy water. So you don't have to disassemble anything and like, put it back together. Mm -hmm. so you don't put them in the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> in the hospital, they're not cleaned at all. I mean, it's only for that patient. The respiratory therapist comes in, does their puffs, sets it back on the counter, comes back in, or gets the next inhaler or whatever. So they use these with the um, corticosteroids too, with the flow vents and the Q-Vars. You know, that's usually two puffs or four puffs or whatever it is. Um, and any shape of um, inhaler will fit in here. Some of them are more round than oblong or whatever that is, and they'll still fit in there with a tight enough seal. So. Mm -hmm. With our high schoolers, that it is hard to convince them to use their spacer, and then if they are just using their NVI inhaler, straight in their mouth is, is still the standard practice to have them then hold their breath for a count of 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, with that's what we face, teach them. Don't do the holding you don't have breath. to hold your breath. In and out deeply for five or mm -hmm. six times. But. Yeah, no, it is still best. They should hold okay. their breath. So mm -hmm. that, how and some kids that? can do it and make it work. But, you know, I've heard different things like, oh, he, you know, it was like we were taught. We don't put it in his mouth. We puff it out here. And I'm like, mm -hmm. who does it that? I'm like, no, it's got to go in the mouth because, you know, um, so they'll open their mouth and they hold it out here. I'm like, well, no, that, he's not getting anything, I doubt. Or he's getting a mouthful of stuff, but nothing's getting to his lungs. That was about five years ago. We got was it? a lot of people yeah. were being told that. that I know. I don't know where that came from. We had camp reunions going. Like that. that was exactly what the Lung Association was recommending. Was At the time? Mouth, okay. With the theory that if you're closed mouth, it's hitting the top of your mouth and a lot of it's mm -hmm. staying on the top of your mouth. But if they're doing it, obviously, in close proximity, open mouth, you can actually see them pull the medicine in, mm. you know. Huh. Because other, if they don't do it right, the medicine's out here and you can see right. it. So th that was my question for you. What are you recommending, closed mouth or open Closed mouth. mouth. And because there's a number of myths too. I mean, even when we made the change to this in our work group up at the hospital and working with children, we used to think if the child was screaming, we're all like, oh good, that means they're breathing hard and they're getting more medicine in. <laughs> that was our wishful thinking. Because the research shows that if you, they're breathing in hard like that, the medicine's just kind of going boing, 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 boing all over their mouth, and it's not really getting anywhere. You really want the babies calm, if you can, um, when you're doing this, and it will be better medication delivery. So that, because I used to believe that too. Oh, okay, it's okay that they're screaming. Even with the nebulizers, we say, oh, good, they're screaming. <laughs> not true either. The nebulizers, what they showed, um, if you hold the mask or the tube like, like less than a centimeter away, um, they're getting like, I got it right here. Okay, zero centimeters away, they're getting 3.1% of the medicine. One centimeter away, 1.4. Two centimeters, two centimeters. It's less than an inch, right? They're getting 0.5% of the medicine. And you know how you used to chase them around with the masks, you know, because they didn't like, they don't like the elastic on their head. So either you have the little peace pipe thing, we used to call it, or a mask, and you're just kind of, you just tell the parent to hold them and just move it around with them. <laughs> I, it's true that the parents getting as much of the medicine <laughs> as they <laughs> can. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring these. I would. Add, I know you've tried this with parents, and parents just don't follow through. But at the end of the year, if there's any way you can remind them to pick these up, because I know you have to throw them out. Because that happened to my kid once, and all the allergy medicine. I was like, really? You threw it all out? But anyway, so these do cost money. Insurance companies may start to revolt and say, you're spending too much money on aero chambers. 
but I'm like, well, it's cheaper than a hospitalization. Um, so anyway, if you can remind them to pick it up at the end of the year, they, they have a good shelf life. I mean, they keep working. I have seen them come in very well used. I'm like, ooh, why don't we replace that? <laughs> Not that I, not, I have no evidence it's not working. It's just sometimes you feel like you should replace stuff like that. So that's really, did you want to add anything else, Bridget, to what we do with our families to help them and kids? No. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, I've kind of gone over my time. I know Diana's going to talk. Any other questions about anything? Yes. I have a comment. I know you said our responsibility as providers to teach the families, which we appreciate, but I think that's also something that we love doing in the school. We Good. Like help the parent understand what it was mm -hmm. their provider was trying to tell them, because we have the benefit of probably being the third time they've heard it. Mm -hmm. so right. They go, oh, oh the <laughs> lights go on. <laughs> so really good. Yes. <laughs> but so we like being on the team, I guess. Yeah. Oh, and I include you in the providers. So yes, we expect you guys to kind of, or hope that you're backing up what we're saying. And, and we know sometimes you call and we get a little saucy on the phone with you and you know, which is just what we do. We, it's not intentional and it's not personal, you know? So, yeah. For one more thing, um, yeah. all the teenagers in athletics, it seems to be that's the popular thing now to improve your performance, you're using um, inhalers. I mean, there's a huge number of athletes that have inhalers. Um, do you have any comments about that? That's the first I've ever heard that. Like oh, they, they, some, they get a diagnosis of asthma or exercise-induced asthma. Trainer. An athletic trainer. Well, an athletic oh, trainer can't prescribe this, but they can't prescribe. Athletic trainers can't well, prescribe. They say they have exercise-induced asthma. Does it, is there any indication that it no. helps a person who does not have asthma? No, none whatsoever. And especially if they've never used an inhaler and they're just doing it right into their mouth, they're not getting it in their mouth. I even, you know, kids that sometimes, um, you know, they say, no, I just do it in my mouth and it works great. And you know what goes through my mind? You don't really have asthma. Yeah. You don't have very serious asthma because it's not doing anything but treating your mind. Yeah. So, do you have a medicine for that in an inhaler? <laughs> I do want to add on to your comment. If you ever have any questions on maybe what we're teaching in the clinic and you want to make sure that they're getting consistent information, just give us a call. Give me a call. I'd be, I'd be happy to take those calls all day long. Much better than a lot of the calls I get. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We better move on. You are very welcome. You know, my toys. Okay, well, we'll have a short five-minute break, and then... Um, Diana Cardi is here from a pediatric outpatient. She's a pediatric outpatient um, case manager for Confluence Health, and she'll be back in about when when we get back from break. Well, let's just have a quick break and use the restroom if you need to. <laughs>
pediatric outpatient case manager at Confluence Health. I'm the only one currently doing pediatrics there. It's a new program that started in September. You can take a card and pass it on. It started in September. Um, eventually we'll have out we'll have case managers in all of the pediatric and family medicine offices, but at this point there is not. And I wanted to come and introduce myself to you because I had a really hot mess of a kid and I called the school nurse, which was Melanie, and she was super helpful with me, so we can collaborate on patients. Um, just so you know that right now, I'm only working with Molina Managed Care Confluence Health patients, but if you have any trouble getting through to the pediatric office or you have any questions about kids that are at Confluence Health, feel free to call me. Um, I do education with kids, I do goal setting, I do a lot of care coordination, I make sure they've had their well child checks, their vaccines, that if they go to specialty clinics like behavioral health or endocrinology or pulmonology, I make sure they get to those appointments and I follow them closely. So I don't know what else to say. What do you want to know? Yes. Do you work with all your branches? or? I work with every single branch in the entire system. Perfect. 15 of them. Are you the case manager? I am the case manager. Well, I have How many question. more of you there are going to be? <laughs> Would you be a person that we could potentially call? And I, I'm assuming I'm not the only one that has this scenario all the time. It's these kids that we have issues with that miss so much school. And they all, parents all claim they don't have a health issue, but yet they're sick all the time, you know. And so, so it gets to a point where we're saying, gosh, you know, if you've missed 30 days of school, you really need to see your doc. And, you know, okay. is there something we can be doing here? To, and, but it's difficult to get to the doctor on those kids because, I mean, for, for me, uh -huh. because those are the parents who won't sign a release. So can we call you and say... <laughs> Just FYI, the kids miss this much school. That's really the reason we wanted to see the doc, you know. And I mean, well, what we need do, some support. I guess yeah, is what, what I'm saying. What you can do is call the doctor's office and sp ask to speak with the RN in the office because most of the offices have MAs, and then there's an RN who manages the phone. And that's what I do and now. And then she'll input something and send it to the provider. So she, okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I do now. But sometimes I'm just. They have to be referred to you first through Melina. 
No, they're referred to me. Um, the patients that are referred to me are either direct referrals from a provider or the pediatricians have asked me to focus on two or more ER visits because it's claims based what our program is. And so then I do a tiering tool on them to see is this somebody who really needs case management. And then I do a whole intake assessment on them and then they're mine. Mm -hmm. Following up on what Julie was talking about, um, and I know that Winnie is, pr is trying to work with Confluence Health to enhance our ability to communicate with them, but uh, I cannot stress how frustrating it is for us as school nurses, being the health care provider in a school, to call up and ask to speak with the nurse in an office about a student that maybe we had received um, an almost non-informative piece of paper that says they can't do PE for yes. one week and that's all it said. So when we call and ask to talk with the nurse, I don't know how often we are told, oh no, we can't talk with you unless we have, did you sign, have them sign a release? Mm -hmm. we, we cannot have every single one of these people sign releases or they won't sign a release and or it's and the incredibly call for more questions. It's, it's it's it is so questions. frustrating for us to be thought of, I think, as a outsider. I mean, we are a healthcare provider. We are trying to provide health to these students where they spend seven hours a day or longer. Right. We are the only healthcare provider for them in this setting and we're just not recognized for that. So I think Confluence House, I've been really frustrated when they send home these forms. It's a carbon copy that you can't even read uh -huh. yeah. because it's so light, you can't read what they wrote. Uh -huh. And then it'll say, no PE for one week. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't tell you a thing about it. When you try to find out why they can't do PE or could they do partial PE or could we do something, uh, then they won't talk to us. So, I'm, um, so I'm working with Confluence Health now and there's a new general pediatric manager. He has a really neat name. I can't think of it right now, but he's a young Adam boy. Hanky. Adam. Mm -hmm. oh. I was going to say Aaron. I knew it started with an A. But I'm working with him and um, we're just going to take some, of course we need to take baby steps, but um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to try to get in and have a meeting with the nurses and talk about how they can think about these things when the, the child is in there at the time. So what my plan is and what I'd like to have implemented just as a beginning is when they have a student come in, as your example, um, they're already thinking, oh, we should probably get a medical records release form signed there and then have that faxed with the summary of that, that visit to the specific nurse because we gave them a list of all of the school nurses in the four counties and their fax number so that's kind of what i'm working on now of course when we when we um have world peace we'll, we'll have um, <laughs> we'll have access to their electronic medical records but that's coming i have to find money and i think there is some money in ospi for the training and tech tech support for that piece of it but there we're close you know we're close as you can say we're close, but the you one know. problem I see though is that Adam's just of pediatrics, and what about all the family medicine departments? It's a start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I know that's a trade, but I'm just starting very. Their quickly. our receptionist has gotten proactive of having the family sign consent as part of the entry paper for release of records to the school. Sure. So that's usually there. Yeah. And um. You just reminded me of something else before it left me. Um, well, we have, I mean, aren't we protected by, oh, yes. if it's for the benefit, so, uh, yes. us, you know. So the other thing is, I think what happened is Confluence Health had education on HIPAA education, and they focused on the one part of the law that talks about how they can provide, they can communicate with healthcare providers. And nurses aren't considered healthcare providers. But there's laws on HIPAA and FERPA that actually say that if you're talking and wanting to clarify in order, it's similar to as a nurse. And I know that this really, we're, ta we're kind of preaching to the choir here, it's just our frustration that I think that they have a misunderstanding. Everyone's trying to do the right thing and not to get in trouble, but really that collaboration needs to happen Absolutely. so that for the safety of the student. Yeah. So that's what I'm working on with, with um, Adam currently. What and, I would say and hopefully is if, you, we'll move if you're in, in a situation where you're just getting really frustrated and not getting anywhere, just call me. 
I'll see what I can do to help you and get you to the right person. Thank well, you very that, much. that's what I wanted to ask, because when I heard you were back on board, I'm like, that's it. Put her on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, my history of working with Diana when she you was a nurse was, she was Absolutely. my go-to girl, and I got yeah. respect. I got immediate call back from her. She was busy, and she listened. She said, I will look into it, even if it was obscure. And so when I heard you were back, but now I want to make sure we're not hounding you, because you that's not really what you're doing. You're doing no, it's not what I'm doing, but at least I can be an interface for you and help you get to the right person. I can still have you on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to help. Any other questions? Okay, so I guess the other Diana, are you next? Yeah. <laughs> it's your Diana day. Like the princess. And if you want to call, Thank you. I'll have Thank to hurry. You. Thank I'm you. A, I'm a good, oh, good. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we can, let's go ahead and just do a quick round about again, just your name and where you're from, so Diana can kind of know where, where you're from, and then she, she'll go ahead and introduce herself. I'm Laura Brumfield from the Meadow Valley School District. Okay. Elvia McKinnis from the Brewster School. Kristen Lester from the Oh, long way. Lori Riley Waterville. Uh, Kathy Rocky Munch. Okay. Bobby Hotchkiss, Wenatchee Specialist. Okay. Three Z's Uh-huh. Christine Alfie Eastmont. And covering Nessa Freda. Freda, okay. Diana Henderson, Bridgeport. Bridgeport. Uh, Amber Verlman from Cashmere. Okay. Hey, it doesn't really Terrace. And what was that? Uh, Pateras. Pateras, that's one I haven't heard of. Mm -hmm. I'm new to Washington, but I've heard so many, I'm, and so far you're the first one I haven't heard of. Joe Wayman, Tenasket, and Okanagan. Okay. Sarah Kruger, Holy City, and Wilson Creek. Okay. Are you Collins? I'm a sub. Tiffany Fosham. Yeah. And, um, and I'm in uh, Mansfield, Miss Phelan, Brewster, and Arondo. Brewster and Arondo, I've heard of. Yes. Julie Robinson, Wenatchee. <laughs> okay. okay. Quincy, yes. Lenore from Quincy. Melanie Wallace from Washington. From Washington. <laughs> 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 uh, Paula Green, India. Okay, India. Yeah, there's. Um, I'm glad there's so many of you. <laughs> it's, it's a big job. Okay. So it's just this. You just just that. Yeah. Okay. 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 I did bring some of my cards, but not enough. I didn't even think about that and I had those in my purse but um, I am a psychiatric nurse practitioner I just moved here from Great Falls Montana six months ago okay. and I, um, I work I was working in pediatrics as sort of an um, integrated model but Confluence Health um, decided to do something different with that program and so they those of us that were kind of doing that got moved out and now I'm working in the youth behavioral health department I'm the prescriber there because we just lost Susan Marnie, who's been here for oh, really? a million years, oh, nice. to uh, Catholic families. She oh, nice. Catholic families. So I am on that side by myself with our wonderful therapists, very lovely, lovely ladies there. Um, but that's kind of who I am, and I've been a nurse for 26 years. Did labor and delivery for 15 and public health and then decided that I wanted to have a different focus. So went back to grad school in my later times. So I've been doing this career for almost three years now. It'll be on th three years on the 1st of April. So that's kind of um, who I am and I still, being a nurse, I know about jumping in and just doing kind of please learn this while you're doing it <laughs> approach to things. So that's what I'm doing. Um, meeting lots of wonderful people in most of the towns now that you've mentioned, I've heard of now. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna talk just a little bit. I'm, drugs are boring, but my understanding is that that is an important thing and I think um, the psychotropic meds are the ones that you run into that are kind of the creepiest to deal with 
because they affect our behaviors and emotions and all that kind of stuff. And we wish we didn't have to do that to kids, and I don't like meds for kids, so I'm kind of the person to probably talk about that. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about a health interview survey um, that I looked at for some statistics about medications for children, and then some treatments for ADHD. I want to mention a little bit about conditions that sort of mimic that, so that if it seems, I know that when a kid is having a lot of problems and if it seems like we're not being responsive enough, it's because there's a lot of things that might be causing those symptoms besides the tension deficit disorder. So I just kind of want to go over just a little bit about that and then a little bit about the medications for um, depression, the SSRIs mostly, but there's also some about the SNRI, the ones mainly that you guys would see more often. There's more to it than I'm going to cover today, but it's a bigger topic than we can do here, um, especially like the um, atypical antipsychotics or the mood stabilizers. I'm not going to go into those today, but those are less commonly done. Um, and then some of the stuff that I read about management things, and we may get to that, we may not, um, but it's on there. I'm, <clears throat> I mainly wanted to have a talk with you about what what we can do to help, because I'm a team player. I don't want to be, I wish that there wasn't that whole, I want to talk with you guys, but I'm told that we have to get all these consents, and it's kind of irritating to me as well, because I'm a nurse, I'm not a something else. <laughs> and so I feel like we're talking to colleagues about the kids, and we need to uh, address it that way, but you know, then there's reality. So I'm hoping they get that whole thing worked out. I'm hoping Winnie was right about that, that whole thing and that gets worked out. And then at the end I have some references that are um, basically some stuff where I got some of my information but they're also websites where I get handouts for like sleep hygiene and parenting kind of stuff for ADHD. Um, the, the forms that I use for um, the relaxed breathing kind of stuff and um, muscle relaxation techniques that I give to people when I I loved when I went into pediatrics and they would say, this girl is having a panic attack, can you go in there right now? And so I would, we would do it all together, dad, mom, everybody. And, and so I just wanted to, you guys to be able to find those forms if they would be helpful to you in any place. And then there's a, another document in there that you could use if you wanted to that was actually produced by um, UCLA's mental health or children or school nurse thing or something like that that I looked at that gave a lot of recommendations about managing medications and what to look for in the school setting, that kind of thing, um, stuff like that. And I, because drugs are boring, <laughs> I have to put my little minions or little things in there. Um, so he's cute, all the kids do their Wi-Fi and never get to meet their families, my own. I called and canceled cable one day. When my I was the meanest mom in the world for about two days and then I came home and found my teenagers having a conversation. It was the most exciting thing. <laughs> This is from uh, the use of medication prescribed for emotional behavioral difficulties. Um, I call them, well, it was in the article too, EBDs. But I thought this was interesting information. It was from a, a health interview survey done for 2011 to 2012. And it was kind of cross-sectional across the country. 7.5% of children aged 16, 6 to 17 years used prescribed medication for EBDs in the six months before that. So that was the percentage of regular kids that were interviewed or families. A higher percentage of children insured by Medicaid programs were using those, medi those medications which for various reasons might make sense to people um, on a number of fronts but basically they're paid for so often that's what happens. Um, and then a higher percentage of children and families um, in poverty. Um, again, for probably various reasons that you all can think 
think through easily. Um, more than one half of children who use prescribed medication for EBDs did have a parent that reported that this medication helped the child a lot. So we are finding that they are effective for many children, but not for all. And then in, a, in this section, I just wanted to point out that more um, males than females are, of course, prescribed medication for EBDs. Typically what is seen, and probably because guys are just more noticeable with that stuff, they, they make a bigger splash. Um, use of mental health services by children 6 to 11 with EBDs. In 2010 to 2012, 5.8% of U.S. children ages 6 to 11 years had serious EBDs and 173 had minor ones. And th this is among children with EBDs, 17.8% were receiving, so these are the children that have those diagnoses, were receiving both medication and psychosocial services. 28 .8 were receiving psychosocial services only, and 6.8 medication only. 46% of these kids with diagnosable conditions um, received no services. Among children with EBDs in 2011 to 2012, 18.6% received school-based psychosocial services only. 11.4% uh, received non-school-based services only, and 7. 18.3, both school and non-school based psychosocial services. In 2010 to 2012, 8.2% with these diagnoses had unmet need for psychosocial services. So the conclusions uh, from this, a lot of times it doesn't meet um, what we think is happening. School-aged children with EBDs received a range of mental health services, but nearly half received neither medicine or psychosocial services. Um, parents were still reporting an unmet need for these services among children. Um, but it's clear that the school-based providers are doing a lot of work that way. And I refer to them often, the counselors, because <laughs> sometimes they can't come all the way to Wenatchee. I, and there's limited resources, so. Um, and this was from a JAMA uh, pediatrics article in 2013, February, a cross-sectional survey of direct household and interviews of combined household and school samples representative of the general population. The dsm 4 at that time, of course, was used for outcome measures um, and about psychotropic medication in the past 12 months. Among youth with the diagnosed mental disorder, 14.2% received treatment with psychotropic medication. Associations were strong between the specific disorders and the classes of medication with evidence for efficacy. Um, but not as well as we would like. Less than 2.5% of adolescents without a 12-month mental disorder had been, you know, not really on the radar, essentially. Um, had been prescribed the medicines. Most had evidence of psychological distress or impairment reflected in a previous mental disorder, subthreshold condition or developmental disorder. And appropriate medication use was significantly more frequent among those in treatment in the mental health specialty sector. What this kind of means and what they're pointing out is that these findings challenge the recent concerns over widespread over medication. I think it's kind of in a way gone the other way because people are afraid. There's lots of reasons we can. I know when they come into my office, well, I want you to fix my kid, but I don't want to use medicine. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and for some of the conditions, I'm wondering why they came then. <laughs> but, <laughs> be well and prosper. <laughs> Um, we do the best we can, and, and I'm all for people wanting to try the non-medication options. And for many people, that is what works. You know, it can totally work. I applaud the dedication it takes sometimes. So basically, these findings highlight the need for greater recognition and appropriate treatment for youth with um, EBDs. Not everybody does require medication, and of course, we have the other side of the spectrum. You know, my kid 
yelled at me, please give them a drug. <laughs> you know, that's equally challenging because they may have had a reason. Here's another little thing. I always thought that I was a little bit <laughs> ADD. Made it with good grades through school, though, so nobody took me seriously. <laughs> um, so ADHD works. Basically, there's things that go into it, and I'm probably going to have to not stop talking quite so much because that's what I do. But genetics, of course, we know plays a, ten a tendency towards that um, environment. Is a big deal, though, too, and can turn the tables either way. Um, Genes are not always expressed in the same way in every person. That's what we, you know, call epigenetics now. It's a big um, field of open study. Um, and, it, and it differs in expression from one generation to the next. Um, brain differences through MRI studies on average, children with ADHD have a smaller frontal lobe than those without the diagnosis. It's well, less well developed. It is where we have our executive function abilities is in our frontal lobe, weaker connections to the other parts of the brain. The thinking is from that the expert, Russell Barkley, I believe his name is, in ADHD, his belief is in all of his years of study is that a child with a, a true diagnosis of attention deficit disorder, you have to think that they're on average, their executive function abilities, their abilities to decide what they're going to do in a given set of circumstances to make that decision happen those types of executive function skills are 30% behind their chronological age. So if you have a five-year-old in kindergarten who is truly ADHD, three and a half on executive function skills. So it is a challenging, a challenging thing. The other thing I have recently discovered, too, is they're recommending the stimulant medications. There's so much history on them and that they are deemed to be safe. I haven't gone here yet, but there is a recommendation that they could be used down to two years old. <laughs> Thinking not. <laughs> not for me. <laughs> Let's try some other stuff first. But it is a thing to be aware of that it is a true thing related, you know, they may be smart, really on the ball, able to learn stuff, but cannot make those appropriate decisions because they just can't. And we know that the medications do work for that. Um, to a lesser extent, certain other parts of the brain are found to be abnormal in structure and function as well, but not as significantly as the frontal lobe. And then there's controversy that exists over whether these findings represent a too, true deviation from normal or just a developmental delay. The thinking now is that some of it gets caught up. Um, as we know, there are a number of people that once they get to adolescence, some not. Some don't need it anymore. They figure out ways to overcome it. And then some people, of course, need it in adulthood as well. You know, they still have diagnosable condition. I thought that that was something happening now, sort of a trend to identifying people in adulthood. Yeah, well, they think, you know, a lot of people just make it, they make it work eventually, but they're really struggling. And it does, it is seen that it's more in adulthood than people realize. I, because what ends up happening is as they get older, they do, they do grow out of the hyperactivity component to a great extent. You know, that whole thing, you don't see adults typically running around and throwing stuff around offices, you know, because <laughs> they can't sit still. You know, they have learned about ways to deal with it or they've kind of, that part has gone away. But you still have people that just, you know, they can focus on anything. It's just that they try to do it all at once, <laughs> you know. Um, and that's kind of what it is, really. It's just that you have no ability to make that decision. This is what I'm going to focus on. And they go, oh, tree, you know. <laughs> And adults do that, too. I have a tendency to, but I'm smart, so. Um, the most common theory, of course, about ADHD is the neurotransmitters. Um, we have our dopamine or epinephrine, not enough available around the appropriate cells to help with that focus and attention. Serotonin is another one of our chemicals, and that one, fixing it with an anti, like we do with an antidepressant, 
doesn't help any at all with attention deficit disorder. So definitely different um, conditions, depression versus attention deficit. Um, so the appropriate treatment is the right thing, but if we have, you know, if a child is actually depressed and having c concentration issues, the um, stimulants are not going to help with the depression. And so it seems like, well, this is not working. You have to increase the dose. So that, it, that's why it's, it's not as easy as it might seem. And then, of course, little kids have a lot of anxiety, which is a whole other serotonin-related, sometimes all of the others, too. But um, And I kind of covered this. Research so far seems to indicate there's some dysregulation in those um, neurotransmitters in our brain, dopamine and norepinephrine. But there's the thought that, you know, this dysfunction, that dysfunction itself could be the inherited thing that they're looking at. Um, and there's the imbalance in those things. So the medications, the stimulants that we use are successfully treat the imbalances of dopamine and norepinephrine, um, and not and serotonin does not do that. Um, the two medication types that we have that are stimulants are methylphenidate and amphetamine. These are the main drug treatments. Both tend to increase the amount of dopamine in the synapses, the spaces between the neurons. Um, but other environmental factors besides medication can impact the balance of the neurotransmitters. So what I like to point out is that the medicines will fix the things that are wrong that they can fix. They can't fix chaotic home life influence. They can't fix really poor nutrition. They can't fix, you know, I'm scared at home and I'm letting you know in the way that I can. Um, so it all kind of overlaps and it's hard to tease out sometimes. So children with ADHD are seen as in a chronic state of under arousal as compared to others when reacting to the same stimuli. It doesn't seem to make sense. But um, they are actually, what it's seen as is that their brain is trying to fix it all the time. They try to fix it, and that's what is seen as creating that hyperactive, we are trying to fix it, but we just can't. And so they're all over the place. And it's sort of seen as the opposite of what it actually is. This is why the stimulants work. It does, that doesn't make sense either, because it gives them that appropriate arousal, so then they can bring it down. That's why some kids, when they're having too much stimulant and they're truly ADHD, seem like zombies because we've given them too much. It doesn't, it doesn't common sense-wise make sense, <laughs> really. But that's kind of what is seen. That's the current feeling about it. So I tried to be good, but I got distracted. It's a story of my life, too, at times. <laughs> um, so the psychostimulants. These are the medications of choice for ADHD. They are very effective. We only have still the two preparations. Amphetamines have been around since the 1930s and methylphenidate since the 1950s. Tremendous amounts of research on them. So we know that they are effective and relatively safe. Um, that they reduce the core ADHD symptoms within 30 minutes with the proper dose. Although similar to drugs like cocaine with the same rapid uptake, they clear more slowly. Speculated that this is the reason they are not as reinforcing as drugs like cocaine um, or meth, amphetamine. Um, so compared to placebo, they reduce overactivity, fidgetiness, off-task behavior, eliminate disruptive behavior, and improve child behavior during parent-child interactions and problem-solving activities with peers. So they're able to kind of get some of that ability. We don't have any good decision pills yet. 
<laughs> um, yeah, because I would be taking them and giving them to all my friends and enemies. <laughs> but that is the, the issue that we're still faced with. We can kind of fix it so that they get to the choice part to some extent, but they still got to make that choice. They have more time to make it, but they still have to make it. And sometimes it's hard to convince parents of that, that you know, that we have to add the other things, like the structure, the consistent consequences, the consistent praise for good behaviors, smaller lists of things, rather than clean your room. Totally sends them off the deep end. You know, what does clean your room mean, and do I have to focus on something? If not, I'm gonna get. Um, so they do demonstrate major improvements in behavior learning recall auditory and reading comprehension lots of good information that when it's properly dosed on the right medication it does help with learning behavior <coughs> excuse me i'm going to grab my water here really quick <coughs> even reducing the aggressive type behavior actually from a stimulant now when i get to the side effects some of that can be different reduction even in antisocial behaviors in some cases. <clears throat> um, sorry, kind of talked about that, increased dopamine. Um, research shows that the short-term efficacy of these medications on behavioral targets resembles the treatment efficacy of antibiotics on, you know, bacteria with um, with weaker effects for cognition and learning but the research indicates that on behavior problems they're real effective when they're the right treatment 70% um, of ADHD subjects respond to stimulants and in some studies with small samples a hundred percent response was found with I guess this one was with multiple dosing one of the resources I put in there is a, um, a volume that gives the research results. It's mostly about research, what the research shows for in the pediatric population for all the psychotropic meds, or most of them. So methylphenidate is the mainstay of treatment for years, uh, and then they, they started using the amphetamines after that when they were first being used for women with that wanted to diet, and then they saw that it did some other things too. So methylphenidate is still the most prescribed. It's thought to block the reuptake of dopamine back into the neurons, which increases its availability outside the cells. That's what we're trying to do with all of our medications is to increase the availability outside the cells. Once it gets reuptake back into the cell, it's not useful. So the immediate release methylphenidate products, like Ritalin, affects seen in 30 minutes. They peak in 90 minutes, and their duration of action is three to five hours. That's it. That's what we get. Most children require dosing with these products three times a day, which involves, of course, the schools helping with um, giving doses. The third dose is often needed to prevent loss of effectiveness or rebound crankiness and tears later in the day when they wear off. There's just that withdrawal kind of thing that happens. And if exercises are greater in school-aged children than preschool children generally, um, that's another reason why I kind of have an issue with that kind of thing is they just don't work as well with the real young ones. I mean, you can give it to them, but it doesn't work. Yeah, they just don't work as well. I don't really know why. I don't know if people know why. And the intermediate and long-acting ones, like Concerta, or um, that's kind of the, one, the methylphenidate product that we go to a lot, um, they often remove the need for multiple dosing and are the current mainstay of treatment. Immediate release preparations may be used to augment um, in the afternoon, sometimes if we need to. Um, most of the preparations use methylphenidate as the active ingredient, but they're different in formulation, duration of action, number of pulses they deliver into the blood circulation. They, they actually know there's a peak at this time and then there's a peak at another time where it just releases that way. 
And these are examples of the immediate release preparations, the methylphenidate tablets, that's the generic. There's also methylene oral solutions and methylene chewable tablets that are formulated for younger children or people that have difficulty swallowing. They peak in one to two hours, which can be delayed by an hour if given with a high fat meal. That makes the peak similar to the immediate release tablets. Um, but the truth is no clinical trials had been done on these when I made this not that long ago. I actually used this information for another thing I had to do, I think, last year. Um, the intermediate acting ones are the older preparations that you you still see them once in a while and people come to me on them, but I never put people on them, if, but I don't fix what isn't broken. So, but Metadate ER and Riddle and SR, they uh, slower onset. Sometimes they need the, the peak effect to be later into the day. And they go for three to eight hours. They're single pulse. Um, they can often be dosed twice daily um, or given with an immediate release AM dose because they work later in the day. And then the longer actings, Metadate CD, I still see from time to time, eight to 10 hours with a dual pulse and it's beaded. The ones that are beaded a lot of times, you can open them and sprinkle them on food and it doesn't hurt it because the beads themselves are the ones that do that. You know, some of them release immediately and then some of them release later. You even have some, I think, that have another. So they're very complicated, the stuff they've tried to do with them. Um, and that Concerta has, is the most complicated that I'm aware of, of a product that it's got a pump. It's kind of a cool thing. It releases um, part of it right away, and then it, the capsule survives your hydrochloric acid in your stomach and gets into your small and, and it keeps water keeps going in and pushing out the methylphenidate paste over a certain number of hours. Can you imagine the ingenuity of coming up with that? <laughs> but. It's kind of a mainstay because of its ability to, um, to do what it does, 8 to 12 hours, and it has an ascending single pulse. It's the more complex of our forms of stuff. And then Riddle in LA, I don't think I've ever seen anybody on that one. And then the lo other long acting one is Daytrana, which is a patch. Has anyone ever seen anyone use the patch? No. They recalled it for a while. Did they? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and I've had, I think I knew of one kid that had to have that. He just couldn't, they couldn't function. I think it, its main effect is later in the day, but it has, it has, um, you know, the skin rash type stuff problems with it sometimes. And it's actually to the drug, not the, you know, the adhesive. My so. understanding is that's why they recall the patch was the adhesive. It was. Yeah. But then. Now well, now they say the drug itself was doing it. I don't know. That was just the recent thing I'd heard. But I've never really had anybody taking it. So, And then we now have dexmethylphenidate, which is focalin and focalin extended release. Um, the extended release, of course, is the dual pulse bimodal release, the, the beaded. Um, Half the beads are immediate release and half extended release. So, and then we have some products for special. The Daytrona patch, of course, is the slow, steady absorption, doesn't reach the peak for seven to nine hours, and no effect at all in the first two hours. So, some people just need that kind of a thing. The oral and chewable products are the immediate release, short duration, um, and then the beaded products like. Riddle in LA is the example they gave that you can sprinkle over applesauce or something like that. Now, the reason we say amphetamines are the newer products is because people didn't start thinking about using them for this purpose until um, after they were using them for a long time for women with wanting to diet and do whatever else they did with them. <laughs> then they realized, ha! 
these work for this issue too. So they've actually been around since the 1930s, but they're considered newer for this purpose. But there's lots, as a result, there's lots of research on these medications. So the reality is, you know, when you have 50 or 60 years of seeing that, that they don't really hurt people to any great extent. Um, they can, it doesn't mean they can't. And I always consider, and I, I am open about sharing this at times when needed with parents, is that, you know, it may be a rare occurrence of some side effect, extremely rare. But if it happens with your kid, for you, that's 100%. And so you don't really care that it was rare. Um, so, and I'm open to that. So I'm, you know, I'm not married to any of these drugs. If parents want to wait, they don't want to do it right now, okay. We'll, we'll wait. But, I know. And I feel bad about that, but you know, I do feel bad about it. But not everything is ADHD. No. I mean, all, not all bad behavior. No, it is not. Most definitely it is not. Um, and so I try very hard to help the parents see that this is what you have to do with children that have these struggles as far as structure. I try, try so hard to get them before they're eight or seven. It's like, we're, ugh. What are you going to do then when you haven't done the structure? <laughs> huh, that we work on it. We work on it. We have lovely therapists that actually work hard on that stuff now. I, I'm actually pleased with them. Um, the ones, I mean, they can offer me ideas of how they do it with parents. Let's do it. Do, do the parents ever, when a parent chooses not to medicate, they want to do other? Do the parents also have therapy that they go to? Cause to I encourage it a lot. Uh -huh. I encourage it a lot. I really do because, you know, well, I even give them, I, you know, say this is what you have to do. I can't do that. Yeah. And, that, and then we get into a discussion about what their needs are, and I think you need to be hooked up with this really nice therapist I know. Because <laughs> they might be able to help you because, you know, it has to be done. Um, it has to be done anyway, even with the medication, because, yeah. you know, the, the medication is not, it's a tool that we use to help. It's not a, it's not the fix-all, although people wish it was. I wish it was, because I'd like to make life easier for everybody. Um, some children have fewer side effects with amphetamines, but it can go the other way, too. The absorption is rapid, peaking in three hours. Foods and other medications, that's another thing I have to put out there is that it's always really important. And I know that you guys know this, and the parents always have, oh, I forgot about that one they're taking. Do you guys ever find out about other things they're taking? Like if they're drinking a lot of Red Bulls and we're also giving them amphetamines, <laughs> that would be information that would be really good to know. <laughs> um, you know, that kind of stuff, or if you find out they're taking some medication that, you know, does the, does your provider know that you're taking this too? Or, you know. Well, sometimes the fa families don't disclose to the, school, I know. to the nurses or the school. And they sometimes even, don't disclose to me don't, either. Yeah, well, they don't <laughs> disclose that they're taking anything. They, they, parents keep it very private. They've got... Well, a lot of them try the, um, the herbal products. Oh, yeah, we know. Uh -huh. and oils. And yeah, oils, a lot of oils. We don't like oils. Because <laughs> then we get into those asthma people we were talking about. Because <laughs> so, they're stinky. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So that price sets people like oils. No, oils are bad, yeah. <laughs> no oils. <laughs> well, yeah, and some of them, yes. Oh, is there any indication that other um, stimulants have a similar effect? Like, are there people who take excessive doses of caffeine, for example? Or yes. Effective or not? In some cases, yeah. And I said, I can't prescribe caffeine for your child. But if you're giving your child caffeine and you're seeing that we don't need any of these medicines, it works for me. Because um, caffeine works for ADHD on a, on a level that is low. Um, but, it, but it does, anecdotally. <laughs> I mean, it does. Even more than that. But it's not something... Because, you know, you can't pharmaceutically say this is the dose you're getting if I order. That's why I don't like the, well, here's my soapbox, the medical marijuana thing. Uh, 
because when we order pain medication for patients, we don't tell them to go in the backyard and grow their own poppies. Right. You know. <laughs> Just a thing. <laughs> I don't think nurse practitioners can even do that. And, but, you know, I get asked, what about this marijuana oil? Would that help? <laughs> I don't know, but I can't tell you to do it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, marijuana oil. I didn't know about marijuana oil. Well, it's not marijuana oil. It's these essential not. oils that they smell for cause headaches for people around the skin. Oh, no, well. there's CBD oil, there and oil. it is successful well, in treating but there's, seizures. That's I not what I know about. That. Really? I know a medical that. practitioner that's medicating his child with CBD and it works? oil, and it's the only thing that's worked. Well, you know, as long as it's a, a known preparation. It's not affecting the quality. No, yeah, well. Not impacting other students, yeah. Um, and so foods and medicines, especially ascorbic acid or fruit juice, decreases the absorption of some of these products, and sodium bicarbonate increases the absorption. So we have to kind of be aware of those, you know, over-the-counter or food products that can interfere. Can I ask something about that? Mm -hmm. Would it not be the best thing to use applesauce then, or is it not enough of it? I don't know that just a teaspoon of applesauce. Um, I know they do have. I mean, we have to do what we need to do. And I usually recommend that stimulants always be given after the meal, because otherwise, I mean, we have to balance some of our knowledge with realities of life. Kid, if kids get lose their appetite and they're losing weight on the medicines and not growing and not getting the things that they need for nutrition. We have to balance that against. So I always tell people, please do it after. Just so you know, yeah. they go right out to recess after they eat. They don't want to miss recess. Mm -hmm. So we give it immediately on the way to the lunchroom. Within two minutes, they have to so Okay. That, work, that tends to just say it tends to work. So they should be getting them at home. I would love it, and I know they do breakfast at school nowadays too, don't they? But some of the kids that are really struggling with their weight, I ask the parents to do the breakfast at home, even if the kids are going to eat again when they get there. Because, again, this whole recess thing, and I'm not hungry because I took my medicine. And, I, and so it's not a question of, you know, little kids that want to play, if they're not hungry, they're not going to eat. Even if it helps, you know, sometimes us older folks, we eat even if we're not hungry because we're not <laughs> running to recess. <laughs> you know, but kids don't do that. And so it's harder to get them to eat well when they're not hungry. Um, so we do whatever we can. But we do want them to take it and we do want them to eat. So we do what we can to work, make that work. Um, Adderall, by its, the immediate release kind, often has to be dosed twice a day to be effective. And the Adderall extended release is the beaded, dual pulse kind, immediate and extended. Vivance is a different uh, product, especially formulated. It's amazing to me all, all these different formulations of the same kinds of products. This one is formulated in such a way that it doesn't, um, it's, the, the stimulant is hooked up to another molecule that can't be, the, it, it makes it so the stimulant can't be a stimulant until it hits the bloodstream. Something in the actual bloodstream releases that holding molecule from the stimulant so it can do its work. It was developed so that it's less likely to be an abused Drug. Isn't that like Stratera? Isn't that what Stratera was? Was like a non-stimulating. Um... Yeah, Vyvanse is an amphetamine. Stratera is not. Okay. Um, so they wanted to make because essentially, um, if there is substance abuse in the family, a stimulant treatment is it's relatively contraindicated mm -hmm. to be. And I have refused to prescribe a medicine for a family when I knew there was a substance abuse bad in the home. And so Vyvanse was an effort to overcome that as an issue so that it wouldn't be desirable to people that have issues like that. 
appetite? No. It still has the same kind of thing. The idea is it is less likely to be, you know how they take, I think that this is true, and I could be wrong about this, but Vyvanse, I think, because it needs to have whatever happens in the blood to release that chemical from the, the stimulant, I don't think it's one of those kind where you can chop it up, snort it, and get a high off of it, that kind of stuff. Yes? My daughter that's at college at Central says that, um, most of the kids take these meds during um, like finals week and stuff that it's just common and accepted and well known. Is it easy for a kid that age to come in and fake that they're having attention problems and get these meds or? Yeah. And that's why I'm really leery about a teenager that comes in and so I got ADHD. Yes, did you get it, di when did you have it diagnosed? Oh, six months ago. <laughs> You know, I have problems with attention. Really? So, <laughs> you know, ADHD is not diagnosed for the first time at 15, for one thing. <laughs> Doesn't happen. Like, really, how do you weed that out? And I mean, I mean, obviously these kids are getting it somewhere. Is there? I don't know where they're getting it, but then I'm not involved in that particular end of the <laughs> spectrum. Have they have their sources, or, and I have. Right. And they do. And I, and one of the one of the ladies I used to work with in Montana, one of the towns I went to, um, was a very very small town, and so everybody knew everybody. And she had been there. She was the manager of our office, but she had been their PE teacher. She knew every all the kids. She knew them all. And she was had her back in the grocery store to a couple of the kids that she knew. One guy was saying, I thought you were going to get those Adderalls for me. My sister hasn't gotten her prescription yet. <laughs> so, and of course, she turned around and said, all right, guys. I just busted. <laughs> And so it was a it was a funny thing, but it makes it, it the the things that happen with those drugs. I I have had a 15 year old come in and say, I'm having problems with focus and attention. This was a 15 year old girl that I knew had five drug charges pending. Her mom came in with her who was on probation for having a meth lab in her home, and they were really mad when I wouldn't give them stimulants. <laughs> Just seriously? <laughs> so. I don't think that's what your problem is, hon. <laughs> so. I have one other question, too, about yeah. um, lately, we've been getting parents bringing in like a three month supply of uh, either a Ritalin or a Dexrin. And I thought they could only get a month at a time. So I'm trying to say how they suddenly are showing up with 100, <laughs> 100 pills of. Is that, that is good information. <laughs> I, I was going to call the pharmacy, but I still haven't done it yet. So I mean, it does make me a little worried because sometimes what ends up happening, and I just I started doing it because I saw the pediatricians were doing it. But if they're stable and in order to not have them come back every month for a script, we oh, give them yeah. three scripts. Not many. But and, they're and, usually postdated. Month, well, it's just the pharmacy. I said just take these to the pharmacy, and so far everyone has said they do, and the pharmacy will only fill one.
didn't get his medicine today. Yeah. You know, well, you don't know that. Yeah. No, you don't. That is an interesting observation. Yeah. We see it. Oh, they'll want to send a kid home even. Yeah. Well, can he go home at lunch and take get his medicine, or <laughs> can his parent come from work? I, uh, it's very aggressive. I understand that the, the job of teachers is really, really hard, and I'm torn about that, I mean, I know that, but yeah, you're right about they shouldn't automatically use that as a almost like a criticism or a punishment or you're behaving badly, so you must not have taken your medicine. It's not all teachers that are that way. No, no, I'm sure not. I'm sure not. Yeah, and that's a whole other issue. <laughs> yeah. Teachers shouldn't be asking questions. No. I mean, if they have a concern, there should be a proper channel of maybe talking to you guys or seeing what you can find out or something. You know, who gives the medicine, typically? Secretaries. Secretaries? Secretaries, Most of us are in a building one day a week. Yeah, most of you guys are, you, one day a week. That's it. Okay. I figured it was something like that, that there was no way you guys could because I talked to one school nurse who said they had 1,500 kids. It's like, well, that's going to work. <laughs> Glad I never had that many. <laughs> Do you hear what she said? She said that would be nice to only have 1,500. Only 1,500, really? I didn't hear that. Okay. My hat's off. Um, these are kind of some of the newer ones. At least they're newer to me. I don't know how new. I've never seen them until recently. Dr. Holden in, in our pediatric department was actually giving some cool event extended release to a child the first time I saw it. But it's a liquid extended release. I didn't even know they could do that. Um, but we need liquids because a lot of our kids will not take tablets. They don't do it. Um, I've tried to get them to practice with Tic Tacs swallowing pills. And, and they kind of like that because it's candy. We could practice with Tic Tacs. So I tell them to practice. So their parents get to buy them candy. <laughs> Whatever. Um, and then we have Quillachu. I hadn't heard of that one. Um, methylphenidate, um, biphasic release, 30% immediate release, 70% extended release. Um, Aptensio extended release is a newer one. It has a lot of dosages and 40% immediate release, 60% extended. And again, this is one you can open and sprinkle the beads, but you don't want to crush or chew the beads. Any of these beaded products that you can open, you don't want to crush the beads or chew the beads. They have to be sure they're not doing that for them to work properly. Some, um, a, someone tried to be helpful with the grandchild and opened the concerta. Oh, that was hard to do. <laughs> that only happened one time, <laughs> and it was never done again. <laughs> never opened concerta. Um, I mean, I, that was a horrible experience for everybody involved. So, and then Avicio. I don't know that these are in common use yet. Some indication for obesity short term for over 12, it's an amphetamine. And some indication for narcolepsy as well. And then adzen, adzenus, extended release. It's an orally disintegrating tablet. But I didn't find, I put this on because I wanted to say this. I looked it up in my Hippocrates app, which gets updated all the time. And it's not in there. No indication of approved pediatric dosage found yet. So that must be like really new. Because Hippocrates gets updated all the time. It's my little drug app. Where I do my interaction checks and my dosage checks and everything. Sorry to ask so many questions. No, everything please. Everything I in my world. I do a summer camp for children and adults with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And because things are looser at summer camp, it's very challenging to get some of them to take their meds. Mm -hmm. So I'm right away interested in telling parents about these, but a lot of these new drugs, Medicare, Medicaid, insurance won't pay for it. 
Do you have any feeling on that? I'm just telling you about them. Okay. <laughs> just so that when they do come up, you will know what kind of that they're a thing. I have seen the equi uh, equ the Quillivan extended release and the um, insurance seem to cover it. But I don't know about these others, and I would, I'm would i never the first one to order something for a kid because that's who I prescribe for as kids. I want to see lots of people telling me about it before I would order it for a kid. We have other options, so I don't. Because you don't know, really. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, you would never see them from me at this point because these are just things that are out there, and I don't do anything <laughs> for a kid that's not in my Hippocrates even yet. Guess no, that's too new for me. Um, and these are the adverse effects. You guys probably know these: delay of sleep onset, headache, appetite decrease, weight loss. Those are the frequent ones that we worry about. Growth typically catches up, but it does slow growth in the interim while we're waiting. But it does. It's not usually long term. Um, but we do have to have people not look like concentration camp victims, so <laughs> we need them to eat. So it's a constant battle of how to do it. I talk a lot of my appointments with parents with really thin children that have struggled with eating about what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So I do recommend sometimes when we can't figure something else out, PediaSure sometimes saves the day. I don't know how much sugar is in that and bothers me because I know that's not good either. <coughs> That. So we rate. I always weigh risk versus benefit. That's what we always look at: risk versus benefit for every decision about medicine, as well as many things. And then infrequently, and this is what I like to point out: um, the emotional lab. I don't know how you pronounce that word very well. Lability. Yeah. That can become too much of an issue for the stimulant to be useful for them. In fact, you know, and then they get ticks sometimes. Sometimes there is a tick syndrome, but sometimes they cause ticks. And if you stop the medicine, they stop the ticks. So that's kind of a thing too. This, um, these are the contraindications. Although it's extremely rare, sudden death has happened with pre-existing cardiac abnormalities or serious heart problems. Family history is also considered. Sometimes things are not diagnosed on a young child, so I'm very careful about asking about cardiac history. And if there's any question of something, I send them for the EKG first um, to rule out a problem that way. Um, if there's fear about it, we do an EKG. Because sometimes, you know, well, I never heard there was anything wrong, but do you think there could be? Me and my sister have, you know, this weird arrhythmia thing. So we go for an EKG. So I don't like people to feel that they're giving their child something that could really hurt them. And if they're feeling that way, we do what we can to alleviate that before we do a medication. Or we try something else. Because I don't want people to feel that they're hurting their child when they do it. Whether they are or not, I don't want them to feel that way. And then the slow growth rates, lower, lower convulsive threshold in children are from stimulants. Um, they're contraindicated relatively in patients with pre-existing psychotic or bipolar illness, especially in high doses. They can induce instability. I have had to take two children off of them because of hallucinations. Um, obviously concurrent substance abuse, Tourette's disorder, eating disorders, of course, we would never do, structural cardiac lesions or hypertensive states. Um, but they can, in rare instances, induce hallucinations. So that is something, if, if a kid starts taking a stimulant and things start getting really wacky, we need, <laughs> we need to know about that right away. And it's okay to stop it immediately or to hold the dose if you think it's not safe. If the teacher is saying, oh, they got really tripped, tripped out, stop, you know, talking to something in the corner, you know. That kind of stuff, we don't want to give that medicine again. Um, they can interfere with metabolism, effectiveness of other medications. So that's why it's important for families to give a full current list of medications they're taking. Um, I know you guys do that. I know they don't tell you stuff. I do it and they don't tell me stuff. So I figure if we both try to do it, <laughs> 
um, it might be good. So, um, so I clearance before stimulant treatment with a child with a known heart problem or family history. I always try to do. And I don't know, and this is something I kind of wanted to ask you guys. Is it too much difficulty if, if there's a child that I know is having a weight issue? Is there a way they could have, be checked weight-wise like once a month at school? So that I didn't have to have their... Because sometimes I tell the parents, I need you to come in <laughs> every month. And they have work, and it's always, it's like, they look at me like they're, I don't know how to make this happen. <laughs> so I don't know if that's something, is that something that we could do? Just write a request on a little doctor's yeah. order. Okay. And you guys could, that would be fabulous. I will, yeah, yes. Opportunity to have the parents sign a release. Too. Yes, well, <laughs> and Mariana is fabulous. She tries, she's our receptionist. I, I'm. She's incredible. <laughs> she keeps all the balls in the air. Yeah, she has them sign up before they come in to see me. You know, is there a school involved? Can we sign this release right now? <laughs> yes. Can I send her then our contact list? Because then she could just fax that. Once it goes through your process, she can just fax that to the school nurse. That the school district that they're in. That would be great. And, and then, that, then at least that will kind of... When you're starting your process, the school nurse she has a, she has a lot of the addresses and and contact information, but that would be fabulous if you send it to her in case she has some she's missing. Okay, I'll just send, I'll send it to you. But yeah, send it to me because I would love it too. If you want to give her forwarded to her information. My yes. Her yeah, information. actually, send it to me because when I'm doing the letters, I like to have it right there to type in the thing, and then I hit my send button, and it immediately does it. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Epic does good for some things, but not for others. Um, and then we always, because I've had kids who get worse anger and aggression wise with um, stimulants as well as the hallucinations, that has happened. And we don't want that to happen. So we need to, those are things we need to know about too. Um, and then the other medications that we need to be sure they're not taking anything um, weird that could go along with it badly. So in summary, stimulant benefits need to be weighed against the risks of the rare serious adverse events. Um, so I always think about those possibilities and what else is going on with the kid. Am I worried about a mood, episodic mood disorder? I don't like to give bipolar as a diagnosis, but they have that lovely category, unspecified episodic mood disorder. <laughs> um, so sometimes I worry about that and that we could make things worse. Um, stimulants have proven benefit for the symptoms of ADHD and they're quite safe in healthy children. Low rate of non-response or intolerable side effects and they can have rapid, dramatic and normalizing effects as people have seen. Not everybody, but I'm sure all of you have seen like with relief, okay, this kid is no longer a problem. Um, you know, it's better he's being more successful in school. And that's the main thing. We want them to be successful and have friends and have people that like them. That's what I tell the parents who don't want to give meds. Um, I always tell them, I don't like meds either, but I want your kid to be successful and to be happy and to have friends and have people who like them. You know that kids that have problems with that kind of a thing, nobody likes them. They, they don't have friends. They start to hate school, you know, and it can set up a lifelong, you know, thing. It can totally change the trajectory of their life. So that's what I talk to parents about. You know, I don't like them either. I wish we didn't have to do that. I wish we could plug them into a socket and fix them right now. But <laughs> we don't have that. So I push a little bit, not too hard, but that's kind of my big my push. I want them to be happy and successful and be able to have... People like them and to see, you know, I got an A on this test. I want to be able to tell people that, you know, or, you know, I got a B or, you know, very exciting. So, and the serious unexpected cardiac or psychiatric adverse events are extremely rare. 
Rates are too low to prove a causal association with stimulants in patients with no pre-existing cardiac disease. So the fact that that is out there, I do emphasize that it's so low rates that they can't even prove it statistically that it's a causal relationship. So it's, you know, with there's no pre-existing cardiac disease. Cardiac disease, yeah, then, then things are not okay. So that is my big, I don't, that's my thing on stimulants. I like to be just as surprised as everyone else about what comes out of my mouth. Some of these I like them because they're so true about me. <laughs> yes. Yes. How do you decide when you're going to take the student off of those stimulants? If the effects are worse than the original problem is one time. And if we just can't, if they're losing weight so badly we can't turn it around, then I have to. Usually we can figure that out. Um, or if they are, obviously if they're having increased aggression or hallucinations, that's a, that's a deal breaker right there. So if they start, say, they start at two, are they, when will they potentially be able to stop taking it? I mean, if, they, if they're not having any of these adverse side effects. Then... Well, I give, you know, what I also believe in is, a, is, is I try to talk parents into, and some of them I have a harder time than others talking them into it, but I like to do a drug holiday in the summer at least once a year to see what the deal is. Do we still really need this? Some people are willing to do a short drug holiday. Some people will go the whole summer. Let's try it. Let's do it. Some people are, really? How about just a few days? It's not going to hurt anybody. Let's see. See what they can do. See how far they've developed. You know, success in school might be motivating enough that, you know, I want to keep making this happen. So even without my medicine, I'm going to try just a little bit harder um, to keep that experience. I figure once they get a good experience under their belt, you know, we have an easier time. And sometimes we can't do without any of it, but sometimes we can decrease the dose and still have effectiveness. But I like drug holidays, and I tell people about drug holidays. I think we need to try it, especially if they've been on for a while. People get scared about it, though. So being all on the same page is a good idea. But that's kind of how I check on it to see if they need it. And I would never give a two-year-old a stimulant. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> They'd have to go to somewhere that. else. <laughs> They'd have to go to the child psychiatrist for that. <laughs> That's not something I would do. And there, these are non-stimulant treatments, and I'm going away. So what I'll end up doing is I want you guys to have your lunch and all that. I'm just going to go until maybe 1230, and you guys can read the rest of my PowerPoint. <laughs> but, and I may skip over that one section about, because I want to go over the meds. Um, these are non-stimulant treatments, relatively few in number. Stratera, some people think Wellbutrin is helpful. If the child has, if it's an, I don't do that on younger children, it lowers the, the seizure threshold. Um, but it is kind of seen as a possible, if the, if the kid has depression also, it's a teenager or something. Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin. I don't use the immediate release one because it has too many side effects. And actually the, the seizure situation is less with the extended release, so I go directly to the extended release if I'm going to use it for that. I haven't used it for that very much here, but they used it a lot in Montana and in group homes. I don't know why, but they came to me a lot on it. So. And then guanfacine, which probably most people have heard of. Um, Tenex is the immediate release one, and Intuniv is the extended release. Extremely expensive, so they will not let us use Intuniv right off the bat, um, even if we wanted to, because insurances won't pay for that. It's probably one of the most expensive, and so it has to. You have to do trials of Tenex and see peaks and valleys of effectiveness before we can ever go to that one. And then I never use, clonidine is too sedating and it has too much effect on blood pressure. I, I use it if there's a lot of, if there's aggression, a lot of aggression. But mostly I use it for sleep because it's sedating. Um, none of these medicines, though, reach the efficacy of stimulant treatments. 
but they may be appropriate options if stimulants are ineffective or contraindicated or just not wanted by the parents. Parents still worry about um, drug addiction from them, which the research shows is not a realistic concern with appropriate treatment. So atomoxetine, which is this Traterra, it's an SNRI, but it, it's not a stimulant or a controlled substance. These can be important considerations um, in some of our families. They increase the norepinephrine and may indirectly increase dopamine. So not quite as effective, although I've had some children for whom they go through their whole trial of ADHD through their whole years on Stratera, and it works fabulous for them. Not as many kids are like that with Stratera. Um, it is not, some people try to use it as a, because it works similar to an antidepressant, it's not an antidepressant and it doesn't work for that. Um, I've had pediatricians that feel that it does somehow, but it doesn't. So um, I'm not, I'm just think, you know, not every pediatrician thinks that, but I've had some that have kind of tried to do it as a twofer kind of thing, but it doesn't work that way. It is rapidly absorbed, peaks in an hour without food, but it, the thing is, though, is it does, even though it's rapidly absorbed, but it does take up to six to eight weeks for it to work well to its intended purpose. So we, this is not the kind of thing like a stimulant where you see if it works or not the next day. You don't know that because Stratera takes a while to work. So for some situations where we need to have that rapid effect, it's not as helpful. Um, but sometimes it's what we need to use. And the therapeutic actions may continue to increase over 8 to 12 weeks. So once daily dosing can be given in the evening, which is an advantage for some people who have really trouble with consistency in the morning. Somehow bedtime seems to be an easier time for consistency purposes, so that is an advantage of Stratera. Um, valued for patients who have not responded to stimulants or do not wish to use them, but it has that medium-sized effect and not as high of a response rate. Side effects are sedation, nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite, may be eased or eliminated with slow increase of dosage. I don't know if I put down there abdominal pain with the stimulants. That is a common complaint is another reason to take it with food. If we have chest pain, then they need to stop and be evaluated because <laughs> it shouldn't. Yeah, when his doctor said, no problem. Well, hopefully they were fully evaluated because that would be a warning flag to me. Yeah. Children should not be having chest pain for any reason. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping that it was fully evaluated and found to be something else. Um, two warnings with um, Stratera. Liver, we have to watch liver enzymes with Stratera because there can be some hepatotoxicity issues with it. And there is a rare increase in suicidality so as would be with an antidepressant, even though it doesn't work for being an antidepressant, but it could theoretically do that. And then bupropion, which is the Wellbutrin, um, increases norepinephrine and dopamine. I guess that's probably why they started feeling that it could be helpful for ADHD. I've heard people say, oh, that works really good, and other people say, no, it doesn't. So it's a second line off-label treatment, which means off-label is not FDA approved for that purpose, but off-label uses are done all the time. And it's also used for depression and nicotine withdrawal. Onset is two to four weeks minimum, usually more than that. Side effects to consider, which often go away in time, similar to most other antidepressants, dry mouth, constipation, nausea, weight loss, Typically with Wellbutrin is going to be more of an issue than weight gain, along with decreased appetite, insomnia, dizziness, headache. Wellbutrin is a more a stimulating um, antidepressant. So you wouldn't give it to somebody that you were worried about an eating disorder, typically. A lot, Prozac as well. Um, 
And then rare life-threatening side effects would be seizures, um, higher incidence with the immediate release preparations, low sodium, and induction of mania or suicidal ideation. And here's our guanfacine, the antihypertensive with a short half-life. Um, more extended release medication is the Intuniv. Can take a number of weeks to see the full effect of treatment, but generally has some effect fairly early on. It's used more for, oh, no, I wanted to go backwards on that. Yeah. It's used more for um, when, it, when it's more hyperactivity and behavior issues, aggression. It doesn't work well for attention and focus. But if, if it's like a little boy that really is just mostly just all over the place, and they're tearing up my office, and I'm thinking, guanfacine, we need <laughs> Right now. <laughs> We see that in my building. We seem to see that more as like the lunch time. Does that mean they get a morning dose of it as well? Um, with yeah, with the immediate release guanfacine, we usually work into that. But sometimes for some kids, it's so sedating they fall asleep in school. I've had to take them off for that reason, because yeah, they're quiet. <laughs> Teacher has to come on and wake them up. <laughs> yeah. but would that give like a stimulant morning med and that as a lunchtime med? Well, yeah, if it works, if if it works, yeah, if it works. But I don't really want to give a med to wake the kid up from the side effect of the other med. <laughs> That's kind of. That's not a toy trick. Yeah, <laughs> not with little kids. With red one, you hmm? see both. Yeah, sometimes because um, sometimes they do the Ritalin and the those medicines during the day, but they still have some real hyperactivity because Ritalin will work for both attention and focus and hyperactivity. Guanfacine really doesn't do well for focus and attention at all. It's more for the calming, hyperactive. I sometimes look, there's a little bit of anxiety associated with the whole package. Guanfacine is a good choice. Guanfacine. I like to do it more in the afternoon because I don't want to give them another stimulant dose at 4 o'clock when they got to go to bed that night. Um, that's part of the reason I do that rather than a stimulant in the afternoon so that we still get bedtime and can go to sleep. Sleep and eating. Yes? So on the guanfacine, when I first started seeing it used, um, a few years back, it seemed to be more that I was hearing it was to potentiate the effect of another drug that it was coupled with, but now I'm seeing it as a standalone. I don't know about that. That was, it was from a children's in service, and they said, you know, when we're seeing this psychotropic that isn't quite effective as we'd want, we'll give them the 10x to kind of bump it more. But what well, is now it's kind of, yeah, kind of, I, it might have been referring to the fact that we often, the combination of giving the stimulant during the day and a little bit of guanfacine in the late afternoon rather than another stimulant, because the stimulant in the afternoon is going to keep them from sleeping. And then we have another problem, because a lot of our problems with mood and anger and irritability, if we just get them to sleep, don't get me started on screens. <laughs> screens, that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> but, yeah. And then clonidine is, a, is another antihypertensive. Guanfacine is an antihypertensive, but it works on one area of the brain, so it's not as profound with the blood pressure thing. Clonidine works on a number of areas, so it can be more profound that way, a little bit of dizziness. Um, initially, and it is very more, much more sedative than guanfacine. But there is a formula, CAFE, that is a longer term. I just don't use cl clonidine as much for that. It's, it's has treatment for aggression. It's a good one for aggression. Um, same kind of idea as guanfacine, and you would never give them together because they potentiate together the low blood pressure thing. And I've had a kid come to me who had been given both by a provider. Well, just give the 10X in the daytime and the, and the clonidine in, at night. And 
mom got the afternoon dose too close to the bedtime dose and the kid had to go to the ER. So I never give them in the same child. Yeah. Too much of a problem for. There's another one called Prazosin that we use that's an antihypertensive that we use for nightmares. It's very effective for nightmares. But that one works so differently that you can give those together with one of these products, but not these two. In fact, if they ever are given it together, I, I, I want to, if it's one of my kids, I'd love to hear about it because someone else gave it. And we need to rethink things because I just, it was scary that what I heard about sounded scary. For ADHD, these medicines can take a few weeks to see the maximum benefit. And then the side effects, of course, are the blood pressure, anything related to the antihypertensive effects. They're not good as antihypertensive medications, so they're not used as that anymore because they're not very good at it. But good enough to sometimes cause problems for our kids. Rare bradycardia and hyper hypotension, sedation, dry mouth, weakness. Very rare but significant clonidine and methylphenidate together. MedWatch, FDA's post-market surveillance, 23 children, heart rate and BP abnormalities, four children had severe events, including sudden death. Very rare, but with all of the children that are on these medicines, we like to think, well, it's only four kids, but just want to put it out there. We have to take it seriously. Now, I'm going to run, you guys can read these, but I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to not do these. But these are conditions, sleep disorders, hearing impairment, um, PTSD, anxiety, um, bad negative home life that has impact on behaviors at school, depression, bipolar, um, learning disabilities. All of these things can look like attention deficit problems um, and are not. Of course, autism becoming more of a diagnosis in recent times. Um, sensory disorders alone without autism can be even more hard to distinguish when there's sensitivities. Difficult to, because I can't tolerate that noise. I can't tolerate my clothing feeling a certain way. I can't tolerate when these people are talking all the time, talking, talking. Those things are hard to tease out sometimes. Hypothyroid, iron deficiency, lead toxicity, mental re mild mental retardation. All of these are conditions that have aspects that can look like um, attention deficit disorder. And nutritional deficiencies or food allergies or sensitivities. Um, harder again to diagnose, but Seizure disorders, when you have the mild little petite mall and you see the kid in the class is just sitting there staring, not paying attention, doing their work, that has been found to be the case in some cases. It was a seizure disorder. Um, and traumatic brain injuries, mild ones, people often don't take those seriously, but they can have caused problems. Um, and then, of course, we know poor or ineffective parenting practices. I don't even need to speak. I'm speaking to the choir there. And here's my little, I'm usually done hearing people before they even finish talking because I'm a fast listener. <laughs> <laughs> I had to stick that one in there even if it wasn't a minion. <laughs> so, depression. I want to just talk a little bit about the medications that we use for that because I think medications is what we kind of wanted to talk about, but I'd like to point out that sometimes depression can look differently in kids than it does in grown-ups. Irritability, um, regression, apathy, lots of somatic complaints. I have a stomach ache, I have a headache, I can't go to school, I haven't been to school for 30 days. <laughs> and a lot of times be depression um, or anxiety for various reasons. Depressed adolescents, intensely moody as we know. Sensitive to criticism. So these are more difficult to diagnose. Uh, um, um, I'm not going to go through that. You, you guys could read the information about that one. The SSRIs. 
These are the most popular types of antidepressants. Um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Basically, they keep the serotonin between the cells instead of in the cells. The main ones that we use, of course, for teens, fluoxetine or Prozac. It's because it's the one that you give to teens that can't remember to take their medicine because we don't get a withdrawal effect of serotonin um, with Prozac. The only one has a long half-life, so it tapers itself off. So kids don't typically have a problem with if they miss. I went to my friend's house for the weekend and forgot to bring my medicine. They're usually fine. But they don't work if they don't take them either. So that's the flip side. Celexa, um, Lexapro is the um, one that was made from Celexa, acetalopram and citalopram. Lexapro is the one that really has approval for teenagers, less side effects. Um, just, it, it was kind of made with teen, the idea of teens in mind. Zoloft's really good for anxiety. Its first indication is OCD, which we have a lot of little kids, OCD. Um, Paxil I don't ever order for anybody because Paxil has this long of a half-life. So if you miss one dose for some people, serotonin withdrawal. Feels like they have the flu. Some people get zappy things in their head when they're withdrawing from serotonin. Yeah. So I never order Paxil. I know that some people like Paxil, but I don't like it because if they miss a dose and then they go to their friend's house for the weekend and didn't bring their medicine, they're going to be not enjoying themselves, possibly. Some people don't have withdrawal syndromes, but we have lots of other options, so I would use that one last. Um, other types are the SNRI, serotonin, and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. These, are, these include Effexor, venlafaxine, or Cymbalta, which is one I've seen commonly used around here. In fact, I hadn't seen it used in kids until I came here. But it is more of a... It is more of a, that additional system. If kids are just so depressed and the serotonin isn't doing it enough, and we want to bring in the norepinephrine, it's a, it's a bigger, bigger gun. Um, then the vaccine extended release works well for anxiety. I was told by a psychiatrist I used to work with, and I found it to be true. That's effect, sir. But I only use the extended release one. Because the extended release products smooth side effects. But we, they do last longer, so sometimes the thinking is, well, we want to see how they react on it. But the truth is, if they react bad on the immediate release one, well, then we're not really telling us anything about the extended release one. So the side effect profile is actually better on the extended release products. The off-label use of medications, I like to put a little thing in about that because it means using a drug that's not for an FDA prescribed thing, done all the time. It is legal for a prescriber to prescribe a medication for a purpose other than an FDA approved one, but it's not legal for the drug manufacturer to market it that way. That's the difference. So you won't see it in any FDA thing, so you have to learn it by practice. What are people doing? And some of them are really good uses, but they are off-label. Well, are you at a much higher um, risk of liability if you use it off-label? Like Not if you really inform the family that it's off-label and if it is the standard of care. Standard of care is different than FDA approval. If there's lots of backup, this is what we do, even though, because if you stop and think about it, there's lots of medications we would never be able to use because people do not go, yeah, I'm going to volunteer my kid to be involved in a scary new medication trial because I'm on board with that for my kid. It's very difficult to do research in children for that reason because nobody wants to say I'm going to approve for my child to be involved in this. I'll do it for myself because I want to get, you know, some good meds. But my kid, I don't think so. So it's very, very hard to get that together. Yeah. So are we needing to be done right now? Yeah. Okay. 
And these are the side effects that we watch for um, for these medications. I'm not going to go through the rest of it, there, but there's a little, another little cartoon thing at the end. <laughs> Basically, what I am hoping that um, is that we can have a situation where people, and I don't know what that will end up looking like, but I do welcome input from all of you and, and teachers. And I just want you to know that part of it. I don't know if there's some way that we can streamline that process. But, um, and I, that's the thing is I want you to know that I am happy to do whatever, if, if we do get that thing fixed where I can just, you know, talk to school nurses about stuff, I would love that. Because that way I could say, can you guys check on this? So that's my thing. That's my own little, little updates. Huh? Yes. Even if it's a brand new med, yes. like in a week, you can say, hey, you've done well. And, and I'd like to say, I think school nurses should know. Some of these parents, the, some of the meds that get prescribed, the, the, the school doesn't necessarily know about. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I wanted to say, is that I think it's important for the nurses to know about it, even if it's being given to the, by the parents at home. And teachers. Yeah. Yeah. And teachers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I left some of my cards. I know I didn't have enough. I have enough. Okay. But I can I'll send out our contact information too with the, with the um, meeting. And I'm the main stuff. one in the behavioral health that does the prescribing for children. Are you only seeing Molina patients? No, I'm seeing everybody that comes in. Okay. If they're insurance, and everybody's insurance covers, you know, unless they're reached access to care standards. And then if they're Molina, then they have to go to the regional support network agencies. Thank you very much. So there's lunch out there. Um, we come back at 1 15. Uh, Jackie Dawson and her gang will be here. Um, there's a vest over here, school nurse vest, that's free to anyone who would like it, right? Bobby? Please. And there's bags right there from the snow conference. Please take one or more. <coughs> and um, I might have had something else to say, but it left me. So there you go. <laughs> so, oh, the snow conference committee. We'd like to do a quick um, just debrief with Liz. I was going to call her. Okay. So once you get your lunch, if you want to come over here, then we can talk, call her and just do a quick All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Three new diabetics all starting right now. So that brings us up to 31 in our Isn't she a kid? Oh, yeah. And he knows even more than I. Oh, good. Because I believe 